Well, good morning, folks. Welcome. It is good to have you here for our Calvin Lectures. Thank you for coming. We've got a great morning and lunchtime uh, prepared for you. Uh, so again, uh, a lot of you familiar faces, but I see a few unfamiliar faces as well, and we're so pleased that you're able to be with us today. Uh, a few little bits of housekeeping I need to do today. First of all, we want to say thanks for the, our guest. This is Dr. Mark Roberts. He is with us for the Calvin Lectures. He, a group of us got together last night, got better acquainted uh, with him. And, uh, you know, Dr. Roberts, I knew him basically through his writing. Uh, he, uh, he's going to be talking about flourishing the third third of life, but really he, he's a New Testament scholar. And uh, so he's published a lot of books in New Testament, particularly commentaries um, uh, that... Uh, uh, that are very helpful in New Testament studies, and also was the director of the Laity Lodge. Uh, for and if you don't know anything about the Laity Lodge, it's worth looking up. I assume it still exists, even though you're not director anymore. Okay, all right. Uh, but really, if, if you're interested in the theology of work, uh, the intersection of work and faith, that was really a significant part of uh, what Mark does, and actually has continued to do at uh, at Fuller Seminary. But uh, we welcome you today. Uh, we're going to be here talking about uh, having three different lecture opportunities. If you're wondering about how the schedule goes, if you've managed to miss this, uh, uh, we're going to, about 9.15, we'll have our first lecture. Then we're going to have a break uh, after a time of discussion at 10.30. And the break area, you can go right back down the hall down there where you came in in Eller Hall. Uh, and there's coffee and, and that kind of thing. They're going to have the second lecture uh, beginning at 1045. And then if you're planning on eating lunch with us today, lunch today is going to be upstairs in the activity room. All right. So just please be uh, familiar with that. Well, everything will be happening on this side of the parking lot. Uh, so lunch will be upstairs. And then following lunch at one o'clock, there is our third and final uh, lecture of the day. And then tomorrow, uh, Mark is going to be with us for worship. Uh, he'll be with, with us at 9 a.m. He'll be with us at 11 a.m. Uh, there will also be time in here, uh, sort of a roundtable question and answer time for folks who would like to ask him questions based on what they've heard and have an opportunity for dialogue and that sort of thing. So that will be in here during the 10 o'clock uh, adult Sunday school hour. Uh, if you're a guest among us today, restrooms are that away. <laughs> Ladies' room a little further down the hall, gentlemen's room uh, right there. Uh, also want to just uh, give a little plug for Calvin Lectures. We've been very fortunate as a church to be able to bring in some really fine voices uh, in, for a number of years to talk about uh, Christian life and Christian living. I've about decided we're just going to start a formal partnership with Fuller Seminary because that's where I keep going in order, in order to find Calvin Lectures speakers. But uh, uh, Calvin Lectures is a part of, uh, uh, is based on an endowment and our giving outside of the budget. And so we really don't charge for Calvin Lectures. On the other hand, endowments do wither a little over time. Uh, and if you are uh, inclined to want to support Calvin Lectures in the future, uh, going forward, you'd like to make a designated gift toward the, toward the continuation of Calvin Lectures, uh, please say something to me about that. I would, we would be delighted to have you do that, that money would be set aside to help Calvin Lectures continue uh, as a ministry here at our congregation as we try to continue to bring really important and excellent voices uh, into, uh, into our congregation for Christian growth. Uh, and encouragement. Let's see, what else do I need to tell you today? We hit restrooms, that's important. Lunch. Um, introductions, we've done that. Uh, and as, so as we prepare to continue on today, let's do that in a spirit of worship. I want to, uh, one of the good things about being a Calvinist is, you know, we're, we, we're supposed to gather in the morning and praise God, right? Uh, folks who adore the Lord for who he is. So let me share a word uh, with you uh, that, I find, that we find in Psalm 100. Uh, the psalmist writes, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. 
It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of this day. We thank you for those ancient words of your psalmist that call our hearts to faith and praise. We thank you that we are your people called here by your spirit to engage in your worship and to worship you with our whole being, not only our voices, but our minds and our bodies. So help us to do that well today as we consider who you have created us to be from our earliest days into our latest days, that we may live fully and faithfully before you. Uh, Grant that these lectures might be a time for us to grow in faith, hope, and love, and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We make our prayer in his name. Amen. So I'm going to invite you to join us in a brief hymn this morning. We're going to sing hymn number 611, Joyful, Joyful. Why don't we stand up and sing that together? seated. Mark, pleasure to have you here. Good morning, everyone. Good to sing that hymn. Thank you. I, I grew up singing that hymn. I love that hymn. And I was probably in, I don't know, my 30s when one day I was listening to Beethoven. I thought, hey, Beethoven knew that hymn too. <laughs> Turned out we kind of borrowed the music from, what is it, 10th Ten, Symphony, I think. Ninth, thank you. Anyway, like, wow, I didn't ever know that was Beethoven. (laughs) So, well, it is so good to be with you this morning. Uh, Really wonderful to be in this beautiful place and to be able to share in fellowship and share in thinking. Uh, I will be presenting things, but then I'm not going to just talk for the next, whatever, hour, hour and 15 minutes. I'll talk for a while, and then hopefully we'll be able to engage and uh, you can s- make some of your suggestions or ask your questions, and we can get to know each other a little better. Uh, one of the things I love about sort of going out to speak is for me it's, it's like half presentation and half research. I, I don't mean to suggest that you're know, like the guinea pigs in the experiment, but I, I, I love listening to people and their stories and, 
and what's going on in their lives and what's going on in churches and what are the challenges and what are the opportunities. And so it's, uh, for me, it's always good to be with you, both with the, the, the opportunity to share some things and to get to know you and your church. And Mike, thank you for your warm welcome here, but also just the way y'all have uh, taken care of me and made me feel welcome. And I'm really glad to be with you. So first off, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, uh, uh, it, 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 it's an honor to be invited to come share, and it's a special delight when sometimes you're, you're treated well. When I was, some many years ago, I was started in the church doing ministry with college students, and I was one time invited to a winter camp uh, with a local college group on one of the campuses in Southern California. Winter uh, way up in the mountains, and it was, we actually get snow there up in our mountains in Southern California, and it happened to be an extremely cold snap with quite a bit of snow. So I got up to this camp way up in the mountains, and it's very snowy, and it was like 15 degrees, and they, they hadn't really informed me of what was coming, so they went to show me to my room, which was this little cabin that was really meant for the summer. I mean, the window, you could literally feel the wind blowing in. The floor was all concrete, and there was no linens, no nothing. <laughs> so I was, yeah, I decided to drive all the way back down and buy a bunch of stuff, including a space heater that I pretty much sat by the whole time. And anyway, this is much better. Courtyard Marriott, get, get, thumbs up. Y'all are treating me great. Uh, so I'm here because I want to share with you out of some basic convictions. And conviction number one is this, that I believe God has planted within each one of us a desire to flourish, that is, to live well, to live with meaning and joy, to make a difference that matters, to live fully and fruitfully. And we want our lives to matter, not just in our early and middle years, but all the way into our later years. I know, you know, I know most of you aren't Baptists, but can we get an amen at least a little bit? Amen, thank you. Um, I won't ask if any of you are Baptists, but if you are, we're glad to have you here. Uh, or or wherever, you're, wherever you're from. Okay, second conviction. We can flourish in the third third of life. Yes, we will face challenges as we age, but by God's grace, we can indeed flourish. Scripture extends this promise to us, and science confirms it and helps us to embrace it. Now, as we'll talk a little bit little later on, you know, there's a lot in the culture around us that actually says, well, you know, that's really not true. By the time you get to third third of your life, you're sort of done flourishing, and it's kind of all downhill. But uh, that's not what Scripture teaches, and actually science gives us a lot of help here too. Conviction number three. In a time and culture when being older is not valued, that's a fairly modest way to put it, when being older is not valued, the church has a unique opportunity to lift up the promise of third, third flourishing, to give hope and meaning to older adults who will contribute in an extraordinary way to the vitality of the church as well as the common good. I really believe that we are uh, truly uniquely positioned in this time of history and in our wider culture to be those who hold up a vision of what life can be as folk get older. And there is a desperate need for that, a great thirst for that. And we have the opportunity to do that, certainly for ourselves, but also for our neighbors. So, my goals. Number one, to help you understand the potential for flourishing in the third third of life, as well as the cultural narratives that would minimize that. So, I mean, you might already really believe that this is fully true, and some of you, I'm guessing, are in the third third of life, and you're living fully, and you're living fruitfully, and you're saying, yeah, I get that. So you may not need much convincing, but maybe I'll give you a little bit of support for that. Second, to ground your understanding of flourishing on the bedrock of Scripture, uh, whatever else we believe about this season of life, we want to begin with what Scripture teaches and what God has for us. Third, to share with you some surprising and encouraging discoveries I have made in relationship to Third Third Flourishing. Uh, I've had the opportunity over the last several years to study broadly 
and learn so much. And there are many things I've learned that are pretty exciting, some of them unexpected, and I look forward to sharing those with you. Fourth, to emphasize the importance of purpose for third, third flourishing and to offer suggestions for how you can clarify your purpose in this season of life. I mean, I won't ask for a show of hands, but my guess would be that some of you actually are pretty clear about your purpose in this season of life if you're in the third, third. And my guess is some of you aren't so clear. That's been my experience uh, talking with a lot of folk over the last, uh, you know, as I say, four years or so that I've really been focusing on this project. And uh, so if you're one that you really know, I, I, yeah, I know what my purpose is, well then, amen. And again, I hope this will reinforce and encourage you. And if you're kind of looking, maybe it'll give you some new ways to think. Uh, goal number five, to help you think, feel, and act in ways that help you to flourish. So in all seriousness, I really do hope that when you come away from this time, you will do at least one thing that maybe you weren't doing before or do something differently, that there'll actually be some tangible way that you will be living in a new way that'll help you to actually flourish. So this, if you just come away with information, okay. But my hope is that some of that information will actually lead to some changes in the way you live. And, and that's certainly been true for me as I've studied this stuff. I have made, and I'll share as we go along, but I have uh, learned things and thought, well, if this is true, then I need to live in a different way. I want to live in a different way. And so I've made some changes in the way I live. And I'll share some of that as we go. Six, um, to inspire you to, well, that's it, to do at least one new thing. One new thing. And to that end, and I mean this seriously, I would love to hear from you. Again, no, no obligation, no pressure. Uh, this is not a pledge drive. You won't get a, you know, this is just, if, if you know, sometime in the next week, if something has really struck you, love to hear about it. Love to hear stories. Uh, sometimes folk will just write me and say, hey, this is what I've been going through in this season of life, and I love hearing that. So you can let me know at markroberts at fuller.edu. That's my email address. And if you remember, you know, six months from now, I'd love to hear how it's going. Maybe something will jog your memory, and you'll think, oh, I'll write Mark and tell him, you know, how, how this has gone. Because what I love and what really encourages me in my work <clears throat> is when I hear that something that I, <clears throat> excuse me, I've said or done is really connecting and making a difference for folk. And there's actually something you can do right now if you are so inclined and if you're technologically inclined, you know, this QR code, if you're able and you have a phone, if you take a, you know, if your phone can register that thing, it will actually send you to that link down there. If you don't have a phone or don't want to do it, you can also just remember. So Dupree.org, that is the Dupree Center website. And that has lots of things. As Mike said, a lot about faith and work. But one of the things we've got is our third third. And so if you go to the website and you look at the top, at the nav bar, and you see third third, it'll take you to that space too. So your choice. But one of the things you can do right away then is, is sign up for our, our uh, third Third Life. It's our monthly newsletter. And that's where we just keep people informed. I'm kind of in the way here. Keep people informed. I could put it on my shirt, I guess, uh, about what's going on. Um, so not just what we're doing, but stories, newsy stories, what I'm learning, all kinds of things. What are we learning about Third Third Life? Okay, a, a little about me. I mean, Mike said a little, but let me give you a little more. I was born May 10th, 1957, in Virginia, actually. I only lived there four months. My dad was in the service in, at Langley. So I was born at Langley. So, but uh, that, that kind of counts. I was born in the East Coast, and actually, my family is all East Coast way back. So I, I, I sort of relate to this coast. Um, I, um, I became a Christian at Billy Graham Crusade in 1963 in Los Angeles. Uh, so that's a North Carolina connection, right? Okay. Um, 
family. I grew up in a, in a family that was a Christian family, partly because my dad also became a Christian at that Billy Graham crusade. Uh, my mom had become a Christian through Young Life. And uh, very close in our family, I was also really close with my grandparents, including my grandfather, my mother's father. And I'll say more about that, but that shaped a lot of my experience and understanding of the third third of life. I grew up at First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood, or sometimes called Hollywood Presbyterian Church, a wonderful church in uh, Southern California. A little picture of the church there. Yeah, see, that looks like a church. And if you look up on the hill, you can't really see it, but that little white line, that's a Hollywood sign. So it's really in Hollywood. And had a, had a marvelous experience growing up as a Christian. Um, you know, a lot of folks had bad church experience. I bet some of you could say, oh yeah, man, my church growing up was not good. I actually had a wonderful church experience. Thank be, thanks be to God. So uh, when I went to Harvard, studied philosophy as an undergraduate, did a PhD in New Testament, and then really felt a call back into the church more than the academy. So I served for a while at First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood as associate, and then down at Irvine Presbyterian Church in Orange County, California, for 16 years as, a, now they would say lead pastor. You don't say lead pastor. Are you lead pastor? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know... It, you know, I was always a senior pastor, and now I've noticed, oh, everybody's calling themselves a lead pastor, so I, I guess that's it. But, you know, I'm old enough now, I could be senior pastor and uh, the other way, right? <laughs> anyway, had a great, you know, I mean, it was a church as a church, but it was really a wonderful church and had a, had a good experience there. And then much to my surprise, God called me to Lady Lodge in Texas. Mike mentioned that, a retreat center out in the Texas Hill Country and a Renewal ministry, care a lot about faith and work stuff. Uh, spent seven years there in Texas, and then again, God was surprised us with this new call back to Southern California, where I'd grown up, and to work at Fuller Seminary in the Max Dupree Center for Leadership. Um, some of you may know the name of Max Dupree. He wrote a number of wonderful books, including Leadership is an Art. He was the president and CEO of Herman Miller, the furniture company that, uh, a lot of office furniture is Herman Miller stuff. In fact, you go to, you go to the airport, generally you're going to be sitting on Herman Miller stuff when you are waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, so, but Max was also a, a great man of God. Um, and in, in my work at the Dupree Center, focusing a lot on faith work, I write a, a daily devotional called Life for Leaders. We email it out every morning. If you're interested in that, by the way, and you go to the Dupree Center website and look for devotions, you can sign up, it's free. Uh, and, and then I got into this Flourishing in the Third Third of Life initiative. And I want to share a little bit, <clears throat> but before I get there, a little more about me, just so you know. So there's my family, my immediate family, my wife and my son and daughter, son 30, daughter 28, wife, you can guess, and then there's me. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned my grandparents. These are my mother's parents who lived very near me when I was growing up. And I spent a ton of time with them and loved them both dearly. But my grandfather, the one you see there, was really my best friend in life. And he and I were really close. And that's really impacted the way I think about the potential as we get older. Because I, I really walked with them through all of the wonderful things and the hard things, and it was really a, a marvelous experience. I've also had people in my life who have older uh, men who have invested in me. Uh, the one on the left is a man named Howard Butt. Um, if you've not heard his name before, that might seem a little odd, but that is his name, um, who is the founder of Lady Lodge, and the person on the right, uh, from the way we're looking, is Lloyd Ogilvy, who is the pastor at First Press in Hollywood, and... Uh, uh, again, so I've had the opportunity in life and the gift in life of having uh, older people make a big influence on my life and mean so much to me, and I, I carry that with me. Well, how I got into this work. So I'm meeting with marketplace leaders, business leaders, educators, people in different lines of work, and, and talking about work and faith. And I always would ask, you know, what can we do for you? 
And at one point, I heard for the first time, fairly early into this work, somebody was telling me about the fact that he was getting on in the company and he knew he had to retire in a few years. He'd been raising up younger leaders. He needed to get out of their way. But he said, you know, I don't feel like I'm done making a difference with my life. And I don't even know how to think about retirement. And my church is no help at all. You guys should do something about this. And I thought, huh. And so I said to him what I would have said many times in that season, which is, well, if, you know, if somebody ever gave us some seed money for it, we'd do it. And that wasn't just a pitch for money. That's the truth. That's how we are funded in the Dupree Center. People, donors and foundations fund our work. And, and so he said, oh, well, that's interesting. And that was the end of it. Well, then over the next several years, I kept hearing this again and again from people who were sort of coming up on retirement and really looking for guidance. And so I would, again and again, I'd say, well, if we've got some seed money, we might do something about it. But I was somewhat resistant to it, I'll be honest. And my resistance had to do with perhaps a bit of bias in me, and I'm thinking, oh man, I don't want to just work with old people. And someone might say, but you, but you are an old people. And, well, I don't want to work with people like me. <laughs> My team was all, I could have been their father. I was literally that old, and I love working with younger people. So I was, and, and, and as I was working this through, my spiritual director, Dwayne, would say, you know, your resistance just isn't about that. It's also about you not wanting to be older. Like, oh, so... I was working that through with the Lord, and a number of things happened, in 2019 especially. So first off, I, just as I was getting to this work, I had the opportunity to do a retreat. You can't really see that very well, but right here, in, sort of embedded in there, is, is this amazing retreat center, Catholic retreat center. This is in um, Malibu, California. You can, of course, see the ocean. This gorgeous place, and a, there were, a small group of some older men at a Presbyterian church one asked me to come lead a retreat for them. And I'd been thinking about this third, third stuff, so I just thought, well, I'd do some of it with them. And I did. And I was just really struck by how much God was doing in their lives through some of this stuff that I'd been just mulling over. And, and I sensed such an opportunity in that context. So that was happening. Second thing happened, I met with a couple named Dale and Mary. You say, well, why do you have a picture of a, like a wood chipper there? Because that's from the Vermeer Corporation. Mary had been the CEO of the Vermeer Corporation. And so she and her husband had, you know, a fair number of financial resources. And as they were talking with me about third, third stuff, I said the usual, well, if somebody ever were to support this, we could get it going. They're like, we think we might want to do that. So it opened up this possibility of I could restructure a lot of my work and begin to focus on that sort of thing. And so then I dug in. This is a picture of me in the library doing research. Actually, this is a picture of me in the library posing as if I were doing research, but then I get back to do the research. And I, I just spent a, a tremendous amount of time reading things relevant to this third, third work. Uh, certainly, and centrally for me, a, a biblical scholar, paying attention to scripture and what does scripture teach us about this, and that was a, 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 an absolutely foundational piece. But I, I, I re read in gerontology and psychology and sociology and neuroscience and all this stuff, and, and there is a vast amount of research actually out there uh, on the third, third of life that I had, and I learned so many things and found them to be, in many cases, really not only interesting, but potentially very helpful for people. So I got excited about the potential of this work and began to dig in, and that's kind of how we got to where we are today. And it was around that time that we started what we call our Flourishing in the Third, Third of Life initiative. I want to explain just a little bit about that language, just why we use that particular way of describing what we do. So the word flourishing uh, 
if, you know, if you're in psychology or education or medicine or social work or really a wide range of disciplines, you probably have run into the term human flourishing. It's, it's a very popular way of talking about living well. And there are different versions of what that is. And often human flourishing is not even defined. You just sort of have a general sense. But there's a, a group up at Harvard called the Human Flourishing Project that have actually done some amazing good work on human flourishing. And the leader of that project, uh, who's actually a professor of public health, Tyler Vanderweel, also, by the way, a very articulate Christian, uh, he wrote a paper on flourishing, trying to say this is what it is. And he says, flourishing itself might be understood as a state in which all aspect of all aspects of a person's life are good. We might also refer to such a state as complete human well-being. Now, those of us who are theologically inclined would say, hmm, so basically that was the Garden of Eden, and that's the life of the age to come. In the meanwhile, we're never going to have complete well-being. But there certainly is the potential in this life to enter into more of what that might be. And the folk at, at Harvard have really tried to flesh out, what does it mean to flourish in life? And it's, it's things that you and I could come up with. If we, just, if we were doing a different thing today and we put up a whiteboard and stickies and all that, you'd come up with things like, well, you need to live with meaning and purpose. That's part of flourishing. And Well, you've got to have some health to be flourishing. And you've got to have good relationships. And so, uh, it, but it's really about living well. Third third. Why do we refer to this season of life as a third third? There's kind of a historical reason for the Dupree Center. In the, the person who was executive director twice before I was. By the way, I'm no longer executive director. About two years ago, I had the, I had the, the, really the blessing of God. About four years ago, I hired a young woman to be my a senior director working under me as executive director. And she is amazing. And as we kept working together, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, she's got so much potential. She's going to end up running this center. But I'm thinking, but I'm not ready to stop. What are we going to do? And it became apparent about two years ago that it was time for her to step into the executive role, me to actually come under her so that I could really focus on this third, third work. Is that, so that's what we did. But the executive director, too, before me, a man named Walter Wright, had written a book while he was at the Dupree Center called The Third Third of Life. Uh, he chose that language, and we've borrowed it because it's a, it's a fairly neutral way of talking about this season of life. It doesn't assume certain narratives. For example, if you, if you talk about this time of life as retirement, well, that assumes a certain story that's not going to be relevant for everybody. Some folk don't retire at all. Other people never really had the kind of job from which you retire. So retirement works for some, not for others. Third third is just a general way. Now you may wonder, well, when does the third third start? Statistically in the United States, uh, it's 52.7 years. If you figure life expectancy, two thirds. 52.7 is the third third. Uh, in my work, I'd say mostly the stuff we're dealing with are people who are sort of 55 and older. Now, we should also say, and I think you would know, if not from your own life, but from your experience of others, that really it's not as if there's one life experience in the third third of life, right? For one thing, there are different seasons. When, generally, when you're younger, although it can not be only younger people, there are folk in the third third of life who are full of energy and strength and health, and then there are folk that are not doing very well, right? And sometimes that's age correlated, but sometimes not at all. I mean, one of my dearest friends, his father got uh, Alzheimer's quite young and has now lived 10 or 12 years. Uh, and he's fit and just his mind isn't working well as a fairly young man. So the third third is just a kind of a neutral way, but we mustn't think, oh, everybody in the third third is the same. Because, in fact, one of the things that the researchers have pointed out is that actually diversity within the third third of life is greater than in any other season of life. 
And that makes sense if you begin to think about economic diversity, physical and health diversity, all the different ways. So, but third third is just a way to say, all of us who are kind of in that season. By the way, if you live to 100, then your third third doesn't start until, you know, 66 and two thirds. So I, I, I'm always saying I'm in the third third unless I live to 100, which I'm not expecting to do, by the way. Though, did you know? So the people that study this stuff seriously are now saying that uh, in today's world, the, uh, any a person born in the United States five or under has a 50% chance of living to 100 now. They're predicting that in terms of continued improvements in health and lifestyle. I mean, you think about that, wait, wait a minute. So those of you, any of you have grandchildren, young? Okay, odds are, and again, these are the serious people. This is not like the internet wacko people. This is the serious people are saying, odds are that half of those, peop, your, those grandchildren will live to 100. And you think, wow, what are the implications of that? For their lives, for the church, uh, depends a lot on what you think about what it is to be older. Um, you can say, oh man, that's going to be a huge burden on society. Or you say, wow, think of the potential of life if you had some good years. Okay, I mentioned the limits of language of retirement and retiree. It, it, not that there's anything wrong with being retired or retiree, but just that's a limited narrative. Words to avoid. Elderly. I don't care how old you, how old you are. You, you pretty much don't want to be called elderly or aged or over the hill. Interestingly, though, the, the research shows that people do not really like to be referred to as senior citizen or even seniors. And I realize that language of senior is pretty common. Uh, so I'm just, just giving you the research as I've seen it is that those of us who could be called senior generally don't want to be called senior because in our minds, that's like our parents at <laughs> generation and we're not there yet. Uh, things like senior moment, better not to say that sort of thing. <laughs> things you can use. Interestingly enough, older adult or older person work. Older people, third, third. The word elder, there's interesting work on that because some are really saying that's what we've got to start doing, talking about elders. But others saying they don't like the word elder, so that's why you get a question mark. Uh, if, if some people refer to experienced people, seasoned. Don't you have a seasoned thing here in this church? Salt? What is salt? Uh, seasoned adults learning together? Yeah, so you use seasoned. Vintage, boomers, some people say. There's more creative things that people use, encore, re refirement, sage, perennial, gaining momentum, third phase, salt. Oh yeah, there are 15 better, or salt, there I go. Uh, the language is important. Yes, sir? Good one, yeah. Yeah. So we want to learn to speak about people, ourselves, and this season of life in ways that are uh, truthful and, and honoring and don't carry a whole lot of negative bias along with it. I mean, it's interesting to me, it, it, and it reminds me of other kinds of language things we're aware of, but you know, Elder might be good, elderly not so good. Okay, but just a little bit on why is the third, third ministry so vital for churches? Now most of what we're gonna focus on in our time here is how this is relevant to you personally, but I wanna talk a little bit about how it's relevant for churches. And one of the big reasons that this is so relevant is the matter of demographics. Um, I expect you know and have heard that uh, the population of our country, but truly the population of the world, is aging significantly. And that's a big deal. For example, on average today, 10,000 people in the United States will turn 65. Any of you turning 65 today? I've never had a taker. How close? Anybody? Who, Who's turned 65 recently? Anybody? Yes? Huh. All right. I mean, just last month. 
So you're close. If I did this last month, we might have hit. One of these days, I want to hit one of these people. But anyway, that's a lot of people turning 65, just saying. In 11 years, there will be more adults 65 and over in the U.S. than children under 18 for the first time in history. And odds are it's never going back. It's just going to become more and more that way. More and more older adults, relatively fewer children. The number of Americans 65 and older is projected to nearly double from 52 million in 2018 to 95 million by 2060. And the 65 and older uh, age group share of the total population will rise from 16% to 23%. By 2030, one in six people in the world will be age 60 and over. And at this time, the share of the world's of, of the population age 60 and over uh, will increase from 1 billion in 2020 to 1.4 billion. And by 2050, the world's population of people age 60 and older will double to 2.1 billion. The number of persons age 80 years and older is expected to triple between 20, uh, 2020 and 2050 to reach. 426 million. So the point is, this isn't just a United States thing. This is a global phenomenon of the aging of the population. Uh-oh, what do they want to do? Oh, my manic software wanted to help, but we don't need that. Now, that's just a kind of an amazing thing. And we'll talk a little bit about different ways uh, people think about the aging of the world but certainly from our point of view in the church, uh, in our desire and calling to serve the people you know, in, our, in our community and beyond that in our world, if those are the people that we have to serve, we really need to start paying attention to what, what we're going to need to do. Uh, about the church, according to LifeWay Research in 2021, churchgoers are twice as likely to be 65 and older compared to the U.S. population as a whole. So, again, the, the Census Bureau, and this was 2019, 17% of Americans 65 and older, and in church, 33% of American church members. So, the church right now is older than the population. And again, it's likely that that will, that will continue to increase. And the United States demographers predict, well, I told you, that half of today's five-year-olds can expect to live to the age of 100. Now, you can do some different things with those realities. Uh, and what we need to partly talk about is how should we respond to this as individuals and as a church? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for our, our ministries? What does this mean for our futures? And one very common response to what I've just shared with you, demographic, is uh, a, a, neg a bunch of negative narratives, and I expect you have run into them, certainly in media, pop culture, maybe among your friends, maybe in your old heart. Maybe when you hear this about the aging of the world, you think, oh man, this is a big problem. Um, one of the negative narratives that's very common is that the third third of life is a time of disability versus capability. One of my favorites, Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, uh, once said, I want to stress the importance of being young and technical. Young people are just smarter. I would love to see if he still thinks that way now as he's a person in middle age and, and, and on. But this idea, this assumption that when you get older, you just can't contribute. You just aren't going to be very good at stuff. You don't have anything to offer. If you start paying attention to the way people talk about the aging of the population in the United States and what that's going to do to Social Security and Medicare, there's always the assumption that basically once you hit 65, you can't contribute to the economy more. You're just going to suck it dry. It's just assumed. Hmm. Along with that, there's another neg negative narrative, which is the third third of life is a time for dependency and damage. Older adults are a gray wave or silver tsunami. I, I, you now watch for that and you'll see it. That it is, this language is used to describe this 
increase in the older population. It's a silver tsunami. Those of us with silver hair, white hair, whatever. I mean, we're just going to like flood in and, and ruin a lot of stuff. You find that in a, there's an article in the New York Times a couple years ago. The American population is getting older and that has devastating consequences for the economy. Many of our most intractable economic ills can be traced to some degree to this ineluctable fact America is getting old. And you'll see it. You'll hear it. And in many cases, you'll feel it. Some of these negative narratives spill into the church, too. Now, I know you all had, um, uh, not long ago, uh, Jake Mulder from the, the Fuller Youth Institute. Jake's a good friend and a partner at Fuller, and they really focus on helping the church to grow younger. I would say, by the way, that they are not against the kind of thing I'm, in fact, they're very excited about the kind of thing I'm doing, but their focus is on younger. But there has been a tendency and certainly when I was a parish pastor, a big tendency to say, man, we got to serve younger people, we got to get younger people in, we need young families, what are we going to do? And a lot of focus on the younger. That's not a bad thing, except that sometimes it spills over to negativity about those who are older, minimally ignoring them, but sometimes really minimizing them, uh, putting them on the margins. But I, was, I found it very interesting, and I think a really, all in all, a good uh, study, 20 years of congregational change, the 2020 Faith Communities Today overviews from the, what are they, the Har Harvard Seminary, does a lot of really good work on the church. So I was interested, I was just reading this, and it had these three different categories. Trends that offer hope. Okay. For example, congregational diversity. More diverse congregations, that's a hopeful sign. Sure, Poss for possibilities of revitalization. These are you know, possibilities we can live into, such as a vision that is meaningful and contagious. And then it had four trends that raise concerns and present challenges for flourishing, such as increasing rates of decline among churches and the aging of congregational memberships and clergy. So we don't get to go in the trends that offer hope we don't get to go in the possibilities of revitalization. We're, uh, we raise concerns and challenges. And I get that. I mean, there is a sense in which that is true. But isn't it interesting? I mean, couldn't this be, couldn't one think about this differently as actually hope for the church? I mean, as I get around, I meet a lot of folk in the third third of life and certainly some have limitations and challenges that are really hard and they need extra care. But I, need, I meet a whole lot of folk who are basically healthy, who have great mental capacity, they have experience and wisdom, many have discretionary time, some even have discretionary money, they're mature, gifted disciples of Christ, and a lot of times they're just sitting there. And I think, what would the church be if folk like that were equipped and encouraged and deployed into the ministry of Christ? I put that in trends that offer hope and or possibilities of revitalization and vision. What if we began to see the gray hairs in the pews in terms of extraordinary potential rather than either people to be ignored or taken for granted or a problem or even every now and then the gray wave or silver tsunami in the church. Okay. What we run into is the problem of ageism. And when I started this work, I really didn't think I would be doing much with ageism. It wasn't in my, on my radar. But as I got into it, I learned a lot about the prevalence and the power of ageism. And by the way, just to say, ageism can flow both ways. There is ageism against the young, and certainly in some contexts. And, but there is predominant ageism toward those of us who are older in all kinds of contexts. So there's this global report on ageism, 
ageism out of the World Health Organization 2021. Really interesting. But among things in this report, so first of all, just what we mean by ageism. Ageism refers to stereotypes, how we think, prejudice, how we feel, and discrimination, how we act, directed towards people on the basis of their age. It can be institutional, built in, interpersonal, how we relate to each other, or even self-directed, how I think, feel about myself. Globally, in this study, one in two people in the world are ageist against older people. Now, if you know much about different world cultures, you know, well, actually, there are some cultures that are pretty honoring of older people, like China, that's got a whole ton of people. So what that really means is in cultures like ours, it tends to be way more than one out of two are ageist against older people. Ageism pervades many institutions and sectors of society, including those providing health and social care, the workplace, the media, and the legal system. Ageism has serious and far-reaching consequences for people's health, well-being, and human rights. For older people, ageism is associated, and this is just, they're just summing up research that has been done. Uh, ageism associated with a shorter lifespan, poorer physical and mental health, slower recovery from disability, cognitive decline, ageism reduces older people's quality of life, increases their social isolation and loneliness, for individuals, ageism contributes to poverty and financial insecurity in older age. And one recent estimate shows that ageism costs society billions of dollars. So this is really a problem in our world. And as I have become more attentive to it, I, I can see it and I hear about it all the time. I don't know if any of you watched the, um, the Golden Globe Awards, but actually three older women won Golden Globe Awards, which is very interesting and very unusual. But one of them, Michelle Yeoh, talked about the fact that when I was young, there was a lot of work, and as I get older in Hollywood, pff, it's really tough. Just one example. Um, just a little more on ageism, not to fully depress you, but we just gotta address it, right? <laughs> there is a study called Experiences of Everyday Ageism and the Health of Older Adults. So there is ageism that is structural and Sometimes it's really mean and vicious. And then there's like everyday ageism, the kind of thing we run into. And this study found that everyday ageism to be prevalent among US adults ages uh, 50 to 80 years. 93.4% of 2,035 adults 50 to 80 years old reported regularly experiencing some form of ageism. That's pretty much all of us. Negative descriptions of older adults outnumber positive ones by six times. So this was a study done of US and, and UK. Basically, somebody collects like all the words in all the media. I love it, it's a media database of 1.1 billion words. So they just, all the newspapers and all the, and they try to collect all these words, television, movies, and then just try to figure out what can we learn from all that. And so they tried to say, well, when, it, when there's reference to older adults, if there's any value with that, what is it, what are the, what's the, the sense of value? Negative descriptions of older adults outnumber positive ones by six times. That's the world in which we live. Washington Post, just over a month ago, ageism is one form of bigotry that never seems to get old. <laughs> and it is one of the remaining um, acceptable bigotries, right? I mean, you can, you can be racist in your heart, but if you go to work and say, well, I'm not going to hire that person because she's, you know, put in any, other, put in any color, that's going to be a problem. But if you say, well, we're not going to hire that person because we're looking for somebody younger, for the most, even though that's against the law, for the most part, yeah, sure. Uh, it's, it's kind of understood. So, there is a question, though. Is ageism wrong? Or is it just an unfortunate reality of life? <laughs> so it's, it's pervasive, it's pernicious, it hurts individuals, families, churches. But is, is you know, 
maybe we really shouldn't be hiring older people because they're just not so good, you know? Maybe that's fair. I mean, I don't care where you come at down politically, but listen to the way people will talk about Joe Biden. Even Democrats, they won't say, he says a lot of things he shouldn't be saying, that guy's got to get on script. They won't talk about that. They'll simply say he's too old. As if that's a sufficient criticism. Now, there are older people who are incredibly articulate and won't say kind of uh, inappropriate things. If any of you have been following Joe Biden for a long time, he's done that since he was a young man. I mean, that's just, but my point is simply, whether you like Biden or not, it is enough just to say, well, he's too old. Hmm. Okay. So is it reasonable to think people can flourish? And I think it is if we take scripture seriously. And this is, I'm going to end up this talk talking about scripture with you. Science too, but that's the next talk. So, it is clear in Scripture, and Scripture is very aware of the fact that there are things about getting older that are not easy and not fun. And if you're my age, you probably, you know, experience some of those. Um, I was just talking with one of you today about how, why does it feel like the cars are smaller and the doors are smaller when I try to get in the car now? I don't remember that. <laughs> like, like, what is it about these cars? They just make them little harder to get into? No, I think my body is a little stiffer than it once was. But the Bible recognizes that. If you look at Ecclesiastes 12, I'll just read part of this. This out of the message. It says, honor and enjoy your creator while you're still young. Before the years take their toll and your vigor wanes, before your vision dims and the world blurs and the winter years keep you close to the fire. In old age, your body no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken, grip weakens, joints stiffen, which is why it's hard to get in the car. Uh, <laughs> Ecclesiastes adds a lot more. If you read it like in the NIV, it's more poetic, but this is really saying, hey, this is hard. This is hard. Uh, Psalm 71, 9, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength is spent. I mean, this is a prayer to God, but clearly this is someone who is aware of or maybe has even experienced from people being cast off in the time of old age. So scripture knows this reality. And one of the things we, we mustn't do when we claim the possibility of flourishing the third third of life is sort of ignore or pretend that there are not hard things in this season of life. There are hard things in this season of life. And we don't have to be ashamed of them or pretend or deny them. You know, there's a whole anti-aging movement that really just tries to even deny the realities of what happens as you get older. That's not what we're talking about when it's flourishing as we get older. There is, in Scripture, though, esteem of older people in Scripture. And that gives us lots of reasons to believe in the potential for third, third flourishing. I mean, you think of how God uses older adults, right? Abraham and Sarah, old. Moses, old. Zechariah and Elizabeth, old. And these are some of the most important people. God did not need to use somebody that old, right? John the Baptist could have been born to somebody as young as, as Mary, the mother of Jesus. But God used older people. There is a lot in Scripture about the goodness of growing old, such as Proverbs 16, 31. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Gray hair is a crown of glory. I'm still working on that gray hair is a crown of glory thing. It, uh, yeah, you know, I had a beard for a long time. My beard in, in my late 40s, it had like a little bit of gray, in it, but mostly a brown beard. So I shaved it off for about 10 years. And I decided I was going to grow it back. And I grew it back. And it came in white. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, like, I was shocked. And then I didn't want to, and then I shaved it off again. I wasn't, I just didn't want to have a white beard. It didn't feel like a beard of glory. It felt like, a, like I was Santa. And... <laughs> I went a couple years, and then I thought, you know, I liked having a beard, and this was part of my owning who I am as a, 
you know, a, a, an older man. Like, okay, I'm growing back the beard. I notice there are a few whitish beards here today, too. Amen. Way to go. You still got a little gray in it, though. That's, that's not. Uh, <laughs> there is also in Scripture uh, exhortations to, for example, respect older people who shall rise before the aged and defer to the old. I think we need to put that up on the walls. <laughs> I, I'm not serious about that. And you shall fear your God. I mean, when um, I grew up and spent a lot of my life in California, when we moved to Texas, and, and in California, I just got to say, most young people don't know this verse, or they don't believe it, and they don't live it. it there's, by and large, younger people are not particularly deferring to or respectful of older people. So I get to Texas. We moved there. My daughter is going to middle school. I have never even been to this school. She's, trying, she's on the basketball team. I don't know where the basketball... I'm supposed to pick her up. So I go to the school, and I'm standing out in front of the school, just trying to, like, what, what am I supposed to do? Because it's after school. And there's a young woman, a middle school girl, sitting down here on the steps. I'm standing there and looking, and she says, excuse me, sir, can I help you? I'm like, uh, yeah, I guess. So I said, my daughter's here. Like, oh, well, let me show you. And she takes me and shows me where the gym is. And I thought to myself, this is the weirdest thing I have ever experienced. Right? She's not out there officially as a monitor. She's just this young person being nice to me. It was really something. I'm hoping in North Carolina you got a little more like the Texas than the California. I hope so. And that's a good thing. A uh, little more on, on uh, what Scripture teaches, and then we'll talk for a little while. The biblical vision of abundant living. So Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly until 65. No, he didn't say that. There is no until. Uh, that is what Jesus said he came for. There's a biblical vision of the life of the age to come that we begin to experience now. Uh, Jesus in John 5, very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. So even in this life, where it's not going to be all put back together, because of what God has done in Christ, we can begin to live into this experience of the life of the age to come, but in part we get to live into it now. Uh, Paul, in writing, and this is actually a text that talks about how those who are rich need to live in, a, in the right way, um, being generous and whatnot, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. And here and again and again, and I'm sure you get this preached in this church because y'all believe the Bible and you got a good preacher, uh, that, it, it, that the Christian life isn't only about what comes later, you know, after we die. It's about that life becoming a part of our life now. We can live fully now, even though we're still living as broken people in a broken world. There's also in the Scripture the promise of living fruitfully, uh, from the very beginning, what is the first commandment in Scripture? The very first given to human beings is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, literally, that meant make more people, but it is also this sense that God put human beings on earth that we might live fruitfully, that we might make a difference. You know, God created the world, and it was very good, it was perfect, but it wasn't finished, right? And we are the ones, through our work, our fruitfulness will help it to become everything that God intended it to be. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. And my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. And so we like to think of, of flourishing, biblical flourishing, human flourishing, as living fully abundant life, eternal life the fullness of life, real life, life that we have in Christ, and living fruitfully, uh, using the life we have to make a difference in the world for God and God's purposes. 
Now, we're going to end by looking at this passage in Psalm 92 that is really for us the foundation of our third, third work. It's Psalm 92, 12 to 15. It says, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, this, is, this language of flourishing, here it's used metaphorically as the, what the, the way the righteous live and what they experience. Uh, literally, the ver Hebrew verb translated as flourish is, for example, in Isaiah 35. It says, the wilderness and dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom. It's that blossoming. It's green leaves. It's fruitfulness. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. By the way, I was noticing yesterday that some of your trees are beginning to flower. Don't you love that? I love the beginning of spring. It's, it, uh, yeah. So you, you could use the language of flurry. You could say, if you want to use the biblical language, that, you know, my red bud is beginning to flourish. There's this line that I just, this is so important. And in old age, they still produce fruit. They're always green and full of sap. By the way, the full of sap one is kind of a, kind of like that, to be full of sap. <laughs> I mean, you get the idea. Literally in the Hebrew, it's full of fat. But the fat in the tree is sap. So that's what they're saying. The point is that the tree has within it that which is required to make blossoms and leaves and all that. But I love this old age line, and let me tell you why. The Hebrew, od yenuvun beseva, that's what it means. That's literally the Hebrew. And now if you don't speak Hebrew, this is what the Hebrew literally means. Seva is hoary head, it's gray hair. That's the main use. It's old age is only by implication. So really what Psalm 92, 14 says, literally, if you read it in Hebrew, is with gray hair, they still produce fruit. Now, I, I own that and I claim it. I'm, I'm happy about that. Even if I'm not 100% happy that I have gray hair, I'm still learning to be okay with that. The, the promise then of fruitfulness, of productivity, of making a difference is there for those of us who are older, have gray hair. Or, and I should say in fairness to some, or who really don't have many hairs at all. I still got, I still got some. Um, this is good news. So again, this is the promise, the righteous and I, in, the, in the sermon on Sunday, I'm going to talk more about this. I'm using this text, so I won't do all of that here. But those of us who are righteous, we as Christians would understand, of course, we're, we're, our righteousness is in Christ. Those of us who are right with God and others in Christ will flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. In other words, this flourishing stuff is a promise for those of us who are older. And they're always green and full of sap. Doesn't deny uh, some of the challenges and pains and losses of getting older, but suggests that there is still extraordinary potential for us to live in such a way that we make a difference and live life both fully and fruitfully. So, with all of that, Time for questions and comments. <laughs> it's not my dog. Found it on the internet, but I like this picture, the dog. My dog wouldn't do that. You know what my dog does? It drives me crazy. We got a golden retriever. Love my dog. She hangs out with me all the time. I mostly work from home. She's mostly great. She's mostly quiet. You know what really gets her riled up? When I am doing some sort of presentation on Zoom. Uh, if I'm just talking to someone in Zoom, she's fine. But I, I guess when I do a presentation, I'm more animated like I am now. I don't, you know, and I, I get animated and I'm talking. So what does she do? She comes over right here and starts barking her head off. 
it just drives me crazy. Like, why are you barking? Anyway, that's my dog, Luna. She's wonderful, but she barks. Right. That's a great question. And I'll talk about, uh, we'll, we'll circle back to that this afternoon. But first off, I mean, part of what you say, so you said there's a, it is often thought that older adults are resistant to change. But then you said, you know, actually a lot of people are. No kidding. I remember when I did, I was doing college ministry at Hollywood Presbyterian Church and in my first year doing college ministry, we, we did this, uh, we, we had a, one of our pastors, his name was Jack Lou. So we had the Jack Luau, that was our event, right? <laughs> Next year we come around and I suggested that maybe we'll try something else. And they're like, no, we do the Jack Luau this time. I said, we've only done one of them. No, we have to do it again. And I mean, these are 18 year olds. So people are resistant to change, but you know, the focus study that would say people aren't really resistant to change, they're resistant to loss, right? And when it comes to our example to things in the church, I, first of all, I just think we want to take that seriously. So, I mean, we sang Joyful, Joyful. I can't remember when I last sang that. My church sings mostly songs that I don't really know. And they're good songs. I mean, I can get into them. So, but there, there is a bit of loss in not singing some of the things that, that are more... So I, there's a loss there. Now, what do we do with that? Uh, we can ignore it. We can put it down. We can rebuke me for such. Or we can say, no, that's really... So we begin to understand. That's a, that's a loss there. Tell me more about that. I love singing that song. I remember when I was a kid in, in, in um, what do we call it? Children's Church, I think. And the, the children's choir would literally process in every week singing Joyful, Joyful. And that was just, that was a, you know, a goosebump moment for me in worship. Maybe one of the earliest experiences I had of really sensing God's presence in worship. So that song means a lot to me. Now, we start by just learning to acknowledge that and talk about what's, what's the loss. Uh, then we talk about, well, what do we do with that feeling of loss? Can we do, you know, is there a way, am I going to become somebody who just hates all that's new in the church because I feel a loss? Or do I sense that there's meaning and purpose? Let me give another example. So when I was at Irvine Press, it, probably many of you lived through this. I mean, we were in this big worship wars thing, right? Because I had a bunch of, about, literally half the church. I did a survey when I first got there. Half the church wanted traditional worship. Half the church wanted contemporary worship. And, and there was like nobody in the middle. That's what we got, right? So what are we going to do with that? And we worked at different things. And we were moving in the, in the direction of actually having a couple different genres in different places. But doing a little more what we would call back then blended. I have no idea what you call it now. But, you know, we sort of mix it up. <clears throat> and I remember we had an elder named Tim. Tim was a very intimidating person. He, was a, he had been a fighter pilot in Vietnam, and then he became an attorney, and he was very successful because he was super smart and super intimidating. Literally once he had an argument with Antonin Scalia in the Supreme Court. <laughs> okay, this is Tim. So he's a tough guy. And he loves the traditional music and does not want to do the more contemporary music in worship. And so we're going after this and going after this. But something happened with Tim that changed his heart about that. And what it was for Tim was the sense of the church's mission in the world and in the community. And in particular, our church, we were right across the street from a high school. And 
over time, Tim came to understand that the music he loved really isn't going to connect very well with those kids. And we want those kids to come to know Christ. And I remember we were having one of those big arguments in session, and Tim kind of grabs the floor, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm just getting, I'm cringing. He says, okay, I've decided what I want. And I'm like, okay. He said, if we put some guitar music in the church, and somehow that helps one of those kids to know Christ, then I support it. And that was literally the end of the argument. I mean, we were done with that thing. Now, what was it that helped Tim acknowledge the loss? Because that was a loss for him. But he didn't lose everything. We, we still sung. But it was that he had, a, there was a greater sense of purpose in life, that he had a vision for, for something beyond himself. That, that, and I think a lot of times what happens with those of us who get older, and that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, is we kind of lose this sense of purpose in life, and then it's really easy to sort of turn inward. And I think we can really help each other in the church not do that just turn inward thing. And part of it is help people to, to continue to live with a sense of purpose that God has for their lives. Because otherwise you just sort of, you know, it's like you shrivel up inside. And then the losses are all you've got. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know of other situations where, I mean, a friend of mine who's a Presbyterian pastor took a church that had a majority of older people. He decided this wasn't good. And so unilaterally decided he completely changed the whole form of worship. Boom. Band only. We never do that stuff. Mostly lost all those folks. And he was like, well, that's, you know, this, we're doing the mission of Christ. And even then, he's my friend. I'm like, what about, like, loving one another, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there are times when it's not just those, who, those of us who are older need to work on our stuff, but sometimes those who are younger. Now, I'll tell you one of the things that I have been really encouraged about as I've gotten into this work is the number of younger pastors who have come to me and said, you know, I'm looking out. And my congregation is 50% people who are older adults. And to grow in their faith. And, and, and so I'm encouraged by the potential both for those of us who are older to have a sense of broader purpose and mission that takes us out of that kind of internal. And I am increasingly encouraged by the number of younger people, younger church leaders and others, who really want to do well this way. So that was a long answer to your question. We got a couple more minutes though, but I love it. Any other questions or comments? Oh, is it break time now? Was it 10:15 break time? All right, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. Keep going. Well, it it <laughs> remind me I was teaching a class at Fuller and it was, it was um, from two to four. And every time, right around four, I mean, everybody was so restless and they're, they're folding up their stuff early and it felt kind of rude and I couldn't get it. And uh, two or three weeks in, I finally said, you know, what's going on? Because the class is, it's not four yet. What are you guys doing? He said, do you know this class is over at 340? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so anyway. Okay, we have a few more minutes, or we can take a break. Well, and this is where, and I don't, 
entirely understand what's underneath this. But you would all know people who are, some are stuck. It's like, I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to learn to text. And, you know, they just get really stuck. And then other people, like your mom, I mean, I teach this, this Sunday school class at a church near where I live in Pasadena. It's a big church, so Sunday school class, about 40-ish people, literally the average age, I think, is 85. This class has been meeting for 60 years, and they started as the young couples class, and now they're mostly the older women class and about three men. And so that's who they are. Well, when the pandemic hit, of course, you couldn't meet. And it was particularly important for older people. So all of a sudden, they're not meeting. One of their members, who is herself in her 90s, decided, we've got to use Zoom. She didn't know. She just knew there was this thing, Zoom. So she learns how to use Zoom. She learns how to use a webcam. She learns how to do the whole thing. And she was the person. So for a while, they would not meet. But somebody would lead singing by way of Zoom. Somebody would teach by way of Zoom. Uh, now that they're back in person, she's still the Zoom meister. She comes early every time, sets up the webcam, sets up her computer. Because increasingly, their folk can't come. Some have moved away. Some are just not able. And she, in her 90s, she loves this. I asked her, I said, what do you think of technology? I love technology. You know, so people have that capacity. Now, the thing, though, that, see, that, that drove her into this was her desire to serve her people. She was living for something, you know, I, I want to I reach people. We want to connect with them. She's still doing it now, even though people can come back, because she says some of our folks can't come. And so it is that meaning and purpose that kind of is, is sort of driving her outside of what could be her her you know, little shell, but the thing I love is she is just so into this. It, it, it gives her joy and delight. And man, I don't know if I'll get to 90, but at whatever age, I want to be like that, right? They were married for 75 years? Wow. Well, that's, you know, it, 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 there's such, you know, and now we're almost out of time. So, so one of the things that I think we have in the church, there, there are certain things that we have because of what God has given to us in Christ and who we are in Christ. And one is that the church could be a place, and sometimes is a place, but much more could be a place, where those of us who are older could just work through some of this stuff with loving brothers and sisters. And, and I don't mean just our peers necessarily, but just a place to talk through it, right? So if you're struggling with some of the changes in church or some of the changes in your life or whatever it is, you know, do you have a place where you can just say, man, it is so hard for me that and then whatever that is, you know? It's, um, uh, it's hard for me that I can't do some of the things I was once able to do. It's hard for me that, you know, uh, uh, friends I have loved have either moved away or, or they've moved on to be with the Lord, whatever it is, or the good thing. So church can be a place where we process this together. I think that's so important because mostly in our world, there aren't those places. Uh, and sometimes the church hasn't been the best at 
processing loss and hard things. Because we sort of feel like, well, we've got to be Christians, we've got to be rejoicing, and, you know. Uh, so one of the things I hope for is that the church could become for each other, we could be for each other, but also for our world. Here's a place where you can come and talk about what is real in your life in this season of life and work through some of this stuff together. Uh, you know, so it, it, I expect some of you are in small groups or some of you are in different contexts. You know, you got the mighty men, you could work, you know, this is good. Uh, but as I, I've said to some of you before, I feel like you folks are thinking about this and doing some things about this. You're kind of ahead of the, the, the wave. Most churches aren't yet creating these opportunities, and there's such more that we could do. Well, I think this would be a good time to stop now. And we have 15 ish minutes. 15 minutes, uh, coffee break, and another hall where you can do it. Awesome. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. We're glad you're still here. I think we turned the heat up a little bit for a few of you who, who needed a, a little extra, you know, so we, we, we did that. Uh, okay, we are ready for our uh, beginning of our second lecture and uh, want to remind folks at the conclusion of this lecture, if you are having lunch, lunch will be served in the activity room. If you're unfamiliar with where the activity room is, follow the herd. Uh, but, uh, but there is an, also an elevator to the uh, second uh, floor, so if you don't want to take the steps and you do wish to take the elevator, um, I'm sure there'll be plenty exercising that option as well, and uh, we will have lunch there. Um, just uh, a couple of, of words of thanks to the Calvin Lecture Committee for, uh, for, for putting uh, things together. I don't, Sue, are you in here right now? She and Steve are out fretting the details. If you uh, see Steve McRae, Sue Godwin Baker, please uh, give them a word of thanks. They've worked very hard to put on a good event and have been great partners this year in, in bringing this event together uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, it have just been a joy to work with. So there he is right there. I'm saying nice things about you. Okay, so <laughs> at any rate, all right. And Mark, let's, we invite you up. Please come and join us. All right, so to be clear, what's, what's the stop time? Uh, well, lunch is at noon. All right, so we'll stop a little before noon. Okay. To give people time to go up the escalator, or the elevator, very slick. There are churches with escalators. We don't have an escalator. No, no, no church that I go to either, but there are some churches in Texas that are, you probably have a few around here too that are, you know, sort of the mega church that are just kind of amazing. So anyway, but I go to a church now that has, it's about this size. We have about 100 people and we don't have an escalator or an elevator. All right. Well, I hope you all had a good break. Whoever brought the donuts, thank you. And the donuts are my, that is my weakness. That's also my reward. Um, the, uh, it only became my reward. I, I basically have avoided eating donuts my whole life because it's not good for me, but I love them. And uh, when, uh, for some reason, when I got my first COVID vaccination, I drive it home, I think, I need to give myself a reward for this. So I stopped by Randy's Donuts and got a donut. I thought, wow, that's really fun. And that is now my reward for when I do things... <laughs> It's so crazy when I do medical things. It's if I go to get, go get my physical, then I go get a donut. It's like, my wife is like, that's really stupid. I, I said, I know, I know. It's just, <laughs> but it, it <laughs> you know, we've all got our stuff, right? I've certainly got mine, but anyway. Okay, so we have about a, an hour before we break. Good. According to my clock, it's 7.53, but that's probably not accurate for here, is it? Uh, my computer still thinks it's in California. All right, what I want to share with you now, surprising discoveries that promote third, third flourishing. So I had I'd shown you this slide before of me doing research, or at least looking like I'm doing research. And I, I, I mean, I love learning, 
And I love learning new things. You know, my PhD was in, in biblical studies in New Testament, and, and, and that's all good. But as I've gotten into this third, third work, I've discovered just all of these other fields that are working on issues of older adulthood. And I'm amazed at how much there is. It, it really is a thing. But it's a thing that most of us are, are really unfamiliar with, partly because it's, it's kind of inaccessible to most folks. The reason I can get at so much of it is I'm part of an academic institution, and any of you who have been, you know, you can go online now and get almost any journal article. It's amazing, amazing. But if you're not part of an academic institution, you go, you get the little abstract, and it says buy the whole article, and you click on that, it's like 50 bucks. Uh-uh, we're not doing that. So I've had the opportunity through Fuller to just read so broadly, and it's been amazing, and it's been fascinating. And it really helps answer the question that I had asked. The Bible offers the promise of third and third flourishing, but what about science? You know, I mean, we believe the Bible, but it would be kind of nice to know that actually in old age we could still bear fruit um, from other sources than just the Bible. It would confirm that. It would help us to know how. How are we going to do that? And what I want to share with you are ten big surprises. This guy is definitely, he's surprised. Uh, these are things that I, most, I did not anticipate. <clears throat> Maybe almost in some cases I um, would have thought the opposite. And I want to share them with you partly because I think they're interesting, but also because they, they are really relevant to us. So number one, <clears throat> Surprise number one, the importance of relationships. And this began with one of the very first books I read when I started getting into the third, third work was a book, Brain Rules for Aging Well, 10 Principles for Staying Vital, Happy, and Sharp by John Medina. John Medina is a neuroscientist. Uh, yeah? Oh! <laughs> Look at that. Don't you love that? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I love stuff like that. You know, thank you for telling me. <laughs> okay. John Medina is, a, as I said, neuroscientist, PhD neuroscientist uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, University of Washington, Seattle Pacific University. He, he wrote, uh, he's written quite a few books. And John is not only a scientist, but he's really great at communicating the uh, practical implications. It sort of takes brain science and makes it understandable to normal folk. John is also a very articulate Christian. I had him, got to know him out at Lady Lodge. So when I saw that he had this book, Brain Rules for Aging Well, I dug into it, and I loved it. And if you're at all interested in this stuff, I would highly recommend this book. It's probably my number one recommendation, because not only is it full of good information, but John is just a hoot. He's just really funny and engaging, too. So this is what some of the things he, he has written. Social interactions are like vitamins and minerals for aging brains with ridiculously powerful implications. Even socializing over the internet provides benefits. The studies are anchored in the safe harbor of peer-reviewed research. And then he says, for the group that socialized the most, the rate of cognitive decline was 70% less than for those who socialized the least. He's referring to one particular study. Older people here, older people here, these socialize a lot, these socialize not much. The rate of cognitive decline, 70% less for those who socialize. Kind of amazing. By the way, John's book doesn't have all the studies and all the footnotes, but he has a website, in case you want to dig in, that has all of that data. The more social relationships maintained, the bigger the gray matter volume in specific regions of your frontal lobe which means that relationships are to the frontal lobe what milkshakes are to your waistline. Wow. Don't you love that? Including my milkshake there. Man, donuts. I would have said donuts, but anyway. The more intergenerational relationships older people form, the higher the brain benefit turns out to be, especially when seniors, he uses seniors, but we'll forgive him, when seniors interact with elementary age children, it reduces stress, decreases rates of affective disorders, such as anxiety and depression, and even lowers mortality rates. Now, I was just talking with a couple of you last night. We're hanging out with young grandchildren, 
and when you're done man you are wiped out you are tired it's hard work and you know it's not just for your body it's hard work for your brain but that is really good for you that's like serious exercise is good for the body serious exercise is good for the brain so one of the best things you can do for you is to hang out with children if you have grandchildren that's kind of an easy go if not you know find some folk in, in your church that don't have the grandparents around and get to know them my children had there were a couple of couples in my church in Irvine who were more with my, more grand in, in reality more actively grandparenting my children than my, their own grandparents who weren't close by okay there's more though the Harvard study of adult development and by the way, I put a lot of links up. If you folks are interested in that, just let me know and I'll, I'll let you know what the links are. Harvard Study of Adult Development. In the late 30s, they began this study in the psychology department. Around that time, uh, the, the discipline of psychology focused almost entirely on abnormal psychology, on problems that people were having. They decided, you know, we need to study sort of more positively what contributes to the good life. What contributes to living well? If somebody is living well at age 80, what predicts that? And so they began in the late 30s, and they got a bunch of Harvard students. One was John F. Kennedy. And these students agreed to all kinds of physical and psychological testing and interview of friends and family and to be followed throughout their lives. Kind of amazing investment. Along the way, the Harvard study has added people from different classes, uh, added women, they were initially just men. It's a fascinating enterprise, still going on today. Now with the second and third generations of the original study folk. A uh, Dr. Robert Waldinger, who is the current director of the study, has a TED talk on this. And this is what he says in the TED talk. So what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives. Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we got from this 75-year study is this, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. That's quite impressive. The previous director of the Harvard study, George Vallant, wrote in his book, Triumphs of Experience, it was the capacity for intimate relationships that predicted flourishing in all aspects of these men's lives. And then later in an interview, he said, when the study began, nobody cared about empathy or attachment, but the key to healthy aging is relationships, relationships, relationships. Now, I don't know about you, but if you had asked me five years ago, what, what are the most, what's the most important sort of component of healthy aging? I don't think I would have said relationships. I think I would have said physical and mental health. Now, physical and mental health matters, but here's what they found. That thriving at age 80, the higher predictor of thriving at age 80, it's not, for example, good cholesterol, but good relationships. And if you're marriage, married, it's having a good marriage. So they're not denying the value of health. And the study points out that. But the number one factor is relationships. And I think to myself, isn't that something? And then I think as a Christian, well, <laughs> we kind of believe that relationships matter. I mean, a relational God created us in relationship. And, you know, wow, that sort of makes sense. But I just wouldn't have thought it. But it's really, I mean, it's very exciting because knowing this is something you can really act on. I mentioned earlier that some of what I have learned in this whole exercise, I've applied to my life, and this is one of the big ones. So I have several really close friends, and we live busy lives. One of them is Todd Volsinger, who was here a couple years ago, spoke to you. Todd's my best friend. I think he would say I'm his best friend. We're both super busy. He travels a lot. And we were probably seeing each other one-on-one -on -one maybe once a quarter. Uh, after this, after learning this stuff, I thought, you know, 
I need to make sure we see each other more often, or at least talk on the phone. And so it's just a simple thing. But things like that matter. Okay, that's surprise number one. Surprise number two, the benefits of nostalgia. I, I mentioned this, I think, last night. This was completely unexpected to me. Because I think for the most part, I've sort of thought nostalgia is okay, but pretty much you better not do very much of it. Or you're going to live in the past. And it's not going to live in the past. You've got to live in the present. And, you know, we're Christians and we press on for the upward call. And so nostalgia, you know, it's like, it's like a beer. Just have one, but not, don't drink too many. Whatever, you know. I'm not recommending the beer, I'm just saying. It's, it's sort of in that category of things that maybe won't hurt you, but don't do too much of it. So then, <clears throat> because of John Medina's book, I discovered this book, Counterclockwise, Mindful Health and the Power of Possibility by Ellen Langer. Uh, Langer was a professor of, of psychology at Harvard. And basically, uh, she reports on this experiment. Well, here, let me put this in here. Uh, yeah. So... The experiment with eight older men who weren't doing well. They were quite frail, they were mentally not very strong, and um, that, those are the men they began with. And the experiment was, take these men, take them to a, a place, a, a part, a place for a retreat, do all these tests on them, physical tests, cognitive tests, emotional tests, so test them up so we find out where they are, and then for five days, we're going to immerse them in a nostalgic environment. It's 1981, but we're going to put them as if it were 1959. And we're going to play music from 59 and newspapers from 59 and talk about... So we're basically going to create this nostalgic experience for five days. And then we're going to measure them all again, see what, see what happens. And it was kind of amazing. This is what Langer writes. The men did significantly better on the hearing and vision tests as well as dexterity and strength tests. They showed 23% improvement on cognition tests. And then she writes, as, as the end of the counterclockwise study drew near, I couldn't help but notice the difference in the participants' appearance. They stood taller, walked faster, and spoke with more confidence. Now, they weren't expecting that level of transformation from simply putting people back into this particular context in the past. There's actually now a group uh, that studies this officially from the uh, University of Southampton over in Britain. Uh, they're the Nostalgia Group, that's a good name for a group that studies this. And this is from their website. So they, they define nostalgia. Nostalgia is about close others, family members, friends, partners, momentous events, birthdays, anniversaries, vacations, and settings, sunset lakes. It is a self-relevant emotion as the, as the self is inevitably the central character in the narratives, but also a social emotion as the self is almost always surrounded by close others. It is also bittersweet, albeit mostly positive, and it is triggered typically by adversive conditions such as negative effect or loneliness. That's one of the things that kicks it up. The bittersweet part, and I'm sure most of us, maybe all of us, understand this. That you'll, you know, it's Christmas, and you're sitting there in the Christmas tree, and you, you start remembering what it was like when your kids were young. And it's this sweet memory. And then there's kind of a sadness that it's gone. And so that, that's nostalgia. They go on in the website. Importantly, nostalgia, once evoked, reestablishes psycho, psychological equanimity kind of balances out your brain. It elevates mood, self-esteem, and a sense of social connectedness. It fosters perception of continuity between past and present. It increases meaning in life, and it fights off death cognitions. Finally, nostalgia has motivational consequences as it facilitates approach-oriented, e.g., pro-social behavior. It, what they're talking about here is they, basically they take people and then they put them through sort of nostalgic experiences and they do before and after measurements of different things. One of the things they measured was about your, um, your focus and your intentionality about your, your main goal in life. And one of the things they found 
is that people who ex go through this nostalgic experience, it's, they don't become more living in the past, they actually become more attentive to and focused on their goal for the future. Now this partly responds a little bit to the thing you were asking earlier about uh, what happens in the church in my experience, and I probably contributed to it, is people are reminiscing about the past. I'm the pastor. Uh, I'm nervous about that. It makes me uncomfortable. Uh, maybe I challenge people not to be so stuck in the past, blah, 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 rather than saying, well, tell me more about that. What was that like for you? And, and cultivating a, a context in which people can do this. Now, it's important to note, though, there's... The, the scholars have a, they distinguish between personal nostalgia and historical nostalgia, by which they mean personal nostalgia is you remember from your life certain experiences. Uh, historical nostalgia is you want to go back to the past and live in the past. And obviously that happens in some church context, and that's not going to be helpful for anybody. But I think one of the reasons people get there is we don't, we don't, just listen to each other about what these things were like. And, and there's, there's so much more that could be said about nostalgia. Um, actually, I've said some of it in terms of church leadership, if you're interested. Um, the role of nostalgia in spiritual leadership with Mark Roberts and Todd Bolsinger. So there's a, a, um, a podcast that Todd does, and he and I talked about all of this because I think it gives us a way forward when you're, you're making change and people are resisting to give us space to say, well, what's that about? And what are those memories? And, and you help people. And you're not saying, okay, we're going back to it. But you're listening. I remember um, when I was a new pastor at Irvine, um, I, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't want to wear a robe in worship. I don't have any problem with that now. For whatever reason, I can't. Anyway, I just didn't want to wear it. And I had a member of my church, Johnny. Johnny was about 80 years old, and she was just really upset that I wasn't wearing a robe. And we must have talked about that 30 times. And it finally, toward the end of those times, I finally, for some reason, lucked into this of just saying, well, Johnny, tell me what, that, what this means to you. And then she started talking about growing up in the church and her pastor and all these sweet memories. And I just listened. I said, you know, it really makes sense to me that you wish I had a robe. And I know you and I aren't going to agree on this, but at least I understand now. <laughs> she said, well, okay. <laughs> but you, you have to promise to wear a robe at my memorial service, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> you know, and so... What I know now, I would have been quicker in saying, well, tell me what that's like. What's that about? All right, surprise number three. The pernicious power of internalized ageism. Uh, internalized age, so there's ageism out there that basically says being older isn't good. If you're old, you're not good. That's out there. Internalized ageism is when you take it inside and you believe it about yourself, basically. And you think oh, being old is not good. And a researcher from Yale, uh, Becca Levy, social psychologist, who has now written this book called Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. So she, early in her uh, academic life, thought, you know, I, I wonder how much difference it actually makes in longevity if you have a positive view of aging and a negative view of aging. So there was a community in Ohio where they basically knew everything about everybody, and they could sort of figure this out and follow them for the years. So she could go in and take out all the other factors and pretty much get it down to one factor, what people believed about aging and how that affected their longevity. And what she found was this. Those who have a negative view of aging, let's say, die at X years on average. Those with a positive view of aging die at X plus 7.5 years. If you have a negative view of aging, not just yourself, but aging, aging is a bad thing, versus 
Now, aging can be a good thing. Seven and a half years of life difference. And that's now been replicated in many other studies. I didn't expect that. I would have thought, eh, year and a half, two years. As she explains it, it begins to make sense. If you have a negative view of aging and you, 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 know, you get some sort of physical ailment, you think, well, you know, I'm old. Yeah, old stinks. I'm not going to get help on this. Uh, you know, you get a little forgetful and you just, well, I'm getting old. Rather than, you know, maybe there's something about my diet or my medications. Or, you, you, it begins to make sense. You, you have a harder time doing certain things that you used to do. Well, I'm old. I guess I can't do that thing that I really enjoy anymore. I mean, it makes sense when you, when you start breaking it down. But it's kind of astounding to think that simply your view of being old has such impact on how long you live, not to mention the quality of life. In the, in, in, so what she says, I found out the single most important factor in determining longevity of these inhabitants, more important than gender income, social background, loneliness, or functional health, was how people thought about and approached the idea of old age. Whew, it's kind of amazing. Didn't think that would be the case. All right, another surprise. Old people are usually happier. Now, a lot of times the stereotype is the opposite. You get old, you get cranky. You get sad, you're mad, not happy. And to be sure, that is true for certain people. We're not saying every old person is really happy. But there is research that suggests that on the whole, those who are older are happier than those who are younger. And I get this partly from Laura Karstensen, who's a Stanford professor, director of the Stanford Center on Longevity. She has a TED Talk in which she says this. Now, there are problems associated with aging, diseases, poverty, loss of social status. It's hardly time to rest on our laurels. But the more we learn about aging, the clearer it becomes that a sweeping downward course is grossly inaccurate. Aging brings some rather remarkable improvements. Increased knowledge, expertise, and emotional aspects of life improve. That's right. Older people are happy. They're happier than middle-aged people and younger people, certainly. She goes on, now it's, it's really too simplistic to say that older people are happy in our study. In our study, they are more positive, but they're also more likely than younger people to experience mixed emotions, sadness at the time you experience happiness, you know, that tear in the eye when you're smiling at a friend, and other research has shown that older people seem to engage with sadness more comfortably. They're more accepting of sadness than younger people are. So there's this integration of the emotional life that as a rule is true of those who are older. Societies with millions of talented, emotionally stable citizens who are healthier and better educated than any generations before them, armed with knowledge about the practical matters of life and motivated to solve the big issues can be better societies than we have ever known. I'd say better churches we have ever known. Now, I would not have guessed that. I would have guessed no, no, the, the sort of the, the happiest time is like, you know, when your kids are young and you're building your family. Or, and, but that's not what the research shows. And most recently, in fact, so the AARP, AARP uh, last year did a study, the second half of life study. It, it's interesting, all kinds of stuff they looked at, but one of the things they looked at was the happiness piece. And what they found is happiness grows with age with a significant spike in the 70s and 80s. This is what they found, interviewing all these people. People between 40 and 49, very happy, 16%. Not too happy, 20. So more unhappiness than happy. As people get older, 50 to 59, 18%, 14%. A little more happy. 60 to 69, 21%, 19%. Still just a little more happy. 70 to 79, 27% to 10%. So 10% of folk 70 to 79 in their survey were not very happy. By the time people are over 80, 34% report that they're very happy. 10% report that they're not very happy. Now, this is a, a, a self-reporting, but it, it fits with this idea. It's not saying that these folk over 80, everything's great. I mean, 
virtually every single one of them would have experienced significant losses in life, right? Loss of physical capacity, mental ability, relationship, spouse often. So it isn't that life is just so amazing, I'm so happy. It's that I've managed to negotiate the, the mixed nature of life in such a way, but that I can invest more of myself and enjoy that which is good. And as a rule, that, or in general, that is what happens. Now, it doesn't mean it's automatic. And we could all point to people we know who, as they get older, uh, get crankier. And I used to, you know, as a pastor, I'd be like, what is this? And I, I still don't have all the answers to this, but some of the things have become more and more apparent. How important relationships are in, relation, in terms of we get older. Um, it is also pretty common for older adults to become more isolated. And those who are more and more isolated would have a tendency to be less and less happy. So again, I think, huh, church, we can do something about that. All right, more surprise, surprise number five. Eager to make a difference. You know, there is another negative narrative I didn't mention earlier, and that is that the third third of life is a time when it's all about you. And you've heard this, especially if you looked at retirement kind of stuff. There's a retirement website. This is a quote. Retire and make this stage of life all about you. After all these years, it's been about taking care of your job, your employer, and your family. No doubt you stressed about how to juggle time and make everything work. Now it's time to finally put yourself first in retirement. It's all about you. Um, there's actually really interesting research, and I would say the jury is out now, on whether retirement is better for you or worse for you. Uh, and, and the truth is it, it depends on many factors like, well, what are you retiring from? If you're retiring from a really negative job situation, probably retirement's better. If you're retiring from a pretty good job situation, actually retirement may not be good for you, but then that, of course, depends on what you do when you are retired. If in your retirement you are doing things that give you meaning and purpose and joy, retirement will probably be great for you. If you retire into basically a life of watching TV and watching your, your favorite news show, whether it's, you know, MSNBC or Fox, and all you do all day is that, you know, chances are you're not going to have uh, much joy in life. It, it's not going to be good for you. But what I have found is I've talked with so many people is that so many folk are not wanting to just sit around and enjoy themselves or relax or play. They want to do some of that, sure. I mentioned early on, I, I, Rod, at this retreat I led of older folk, he said, and this guy's an amazing guy. He is, uh, he is the uncle to some of the most culturally famous people in the country, and I, 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 it wouldn't be fair to say their name, but you would all know who we were talking about. So he has, he's a very man of much significance. He says, they all just think I need to sit on my porch and rock and drink a beer. That's what they, that's, that's what they, they said, I, I got stuff to do. I don't want to do that. Uh, my friend Mary, who's one that I mentioned earlier, had been the, uh, the CEO of the Vermeer Corporation. I mean, massive responsibility. And when she retired from Vermeer, I mean, her thing was, you know, because of my work, which I loved, I, I wasn't able to invest as much time in my family then. Now I can do that. So she's become very intentional about investing more in her family. That's her thing. Uh, my friend Steve, who officially retired on December 31st, he's taken a bit of a sabbatical from anything for a few months, but he can't wait to get back in and really start investing more and more into mentoring people. I mean, there's so many others. I'm going to mention all of these. But what I, what I find is that Older adults don't want to just sit around and don't want to just play. We like the idea that there's a little, that our, our, we have more freedom, that we're not on the clock in the way we once were. 
but we, we want to make a difference. And this fits with research, uh, especially in the whole notion of generativity. You may or may not know that word. A generativity is a need to nurture and guide younger people and contribute to the next generation. Uh, really, the major proponent of generativity was Eric Erickson, who was a, a psychologist at Harvard. Um, and in, in the life cycle completed, one of his books, he and his wife wrote, indeed, old people can and need to maintain a grand generative function. Here's the thing, and I think you would understand it. As, as we get older, we actually want to leave something behind that's good for the next generations. We would like to help their lives be better, certainly in our family, but beyond our family, in the church or the world. You find that in scripture, by the way. Psalm 71, 17 to 18. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to all the generations to come. God has made us such that we care about the generations to come. And as I talk with folk all over the place, they resonate with this. Now, in some cases, <clears throat> because of, of uh, certain kinds of challenges or limitations or, or ageism, you know, they're not thinking that way. But, but, but we can help release each other to think, you know, what is the difference I really want to make with my life that I'm going to leave behind? Uh, you know, we talk about legacy, and there's financial legacy, and, and that's important, but what beyond finances do I want to give away to the next generation? So, my experience, and, it, and it's somewhat a surprise, because I think I sort of bought into the idea that most folks just want to retire and play. Even though the funny thing is, I never wanted to do that. My grandfather didn't do that. I mentioned I was close to my grandma. He retired about 67. He'd been a civil engineer, been responsible for building some of the largest buildings in Los Angeles back in the day. And so he retires, and he, he starts volunteering. YWCA, his church, a local seminary, the Braille Institute, doing engineering work for them, pro bono. And he said to me once, he said, you know, I'm working just as hard as when I was with the company. I just don't get paid anymore. But he wasn't complaining about that. He loved doing that. It gave him meaning and purpose. He wanted to make a difference with his life. And so for about the next 10 years after retirement, he was as busy as anything. And it, it, it mattered to him. So I don't know where I got the idea that it would be fun to retire and just sit around. Uh, surprise number six, purpose and aging. Actually, that's, I'm holding off for the afternoon. That's what we're going to talk about this afternoon, how important purpose is for healthy aging. So that's kind of the hook to get you back, I guess. All right. Surprise number seven. This one really astounded me. Because when you picture an entrepreneur, if I said picture an entrepreneur, you know, what might you envision? And I think many of you would envision something like this, right? Young guy in a hoodie, drinking, that's probably an energy drink, got his phone, on his computer. This is what entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are. And if you ever go, to the, ever go to the San Francisco Bay Area in California, I mean, you see like a bazillion of these guys. I went to, you know Yelp? Some of you know Yelp? So I go to Yelp headquarters because there is a guy, uh, um, a senior officer of Yelp, who is a strong Christian. I went to meet him at Yelp. So I, I, I better dress casually, because this is a, you know. So I was probably dressed like this. I don't think I had my vest on. So it's just a shirt and went in. We, so we go to this big place where there's like the coffee bar. They have free coffee bar. And so I'm in a room of like 100 Yelp employees. And I look around and I think, I am the only guy in here who has a collar. I mean, it's not the end of the world by that. Yeah, everybody's wearing t-shirts. There are no collars. I thought, well, okay. So you picture, these are entrepreneurs. Uh, 
You know, they never wash. They just, like, they're Steve Jobs, right? He never washed. You know that? It was pretty gross when he was young. He thought if he drank endless fruit juice, he wouldn't have to bathe. I'm not kidding you. That's the guy who's, like, changed our life. This thing, this thing. All right, enough on that. But could this be a picture of an entrepreneur? Hmm. Or what about this? One of the things I found is that increasingly, startups are being started by a partnership between an older person and a younger person. Very intentionally. Interesting. But the Kauffman Foundation out of Kansas City is, is really the nation's leading think tank in support of entrepreneurship. I mean, they do really serious research. They support stuff. They're really amazing. And one of the things they do every year is they measure like who's starting up businesses. And they look at socioeconomic things, they look at racial ethnic things, they look at age, who's starting businesses. So 2020, last time they, they published these results. This is what they found, that if you just look at the who's starting up businesses, people 20 to 24, 25.7%. People 35 to 44, 23%. 45 to 54, 26.7%. 55 to 64, 24.5%. Now, that's a fairly even breakdown, but notice a couple things. One is the 20 to 34s get 15 years, the 55 to 64s get 10 years. A lot of folk are retiring at whatever age, 65-ish, and actually starting businesses after retirement. Have any of you done that, or do you know anybody who's done that? It's, it, it, it will be more and more common. So, if you look at that, you also look at the fact that 45 to 54 is 26.7, but the last couple of years in, in, between 53 and 54 is actually in the third third. So if you take that, you say, the truth would be, more startups in the U.S. are being started by people in the third third of life than in any other age bracket. These, this should be your picture of an entrepreneur. Didn't expect that. Now that I've been talking around, I, I, I'm not surprised. Because a, a lot of times people retire and they think, well, I'm not done and what do I want to do? And they start stuff. Now, that's not the whole of the research, though. There is also, <clears throat> this is from Kellogg Insight. That's at Kellogg, which is a school of management at Nor Northwestern. Among the very fastest growing new, te new tech companies, the average founder was 45 at the time of founding. Furthermore, a given 50-year-old entrepreneur is nearly twice as likely to have a runaway success as a 30-year-old. So the Mark Zuckerberg picture isn't the dominant picture. The, the most, it's more likely that a startup person is older and an older startup person will be more successful. <coughs> Another study, just published in Forbes, this study shows that the likelihood of success of a founder increases with age until age 60. The older you get, the more likely your chances are. Now, if you read this article and you look at the, the graph, it's not like you get to 60 and then it plummets. Your chances of success at you know, 30 are here. It goes up, 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 up to about 60, and then it starts coming down a little. But you're still way the heck higher than there. In other words, if you, those of us right here, if we went out and started a business, the odds are that we would be more successful than if our children started the business. But again, like I'm saying, increasingly, folk are saying, well, I don't know that I want to do all that business startup stuff, but let me find a, a, a younger partner. You know, somebody's got tons of energy. You know, I mentioned that in my work at the Dupree Center, I was the executive director. And, and, you know, we promoted the person that I had hired. So she's in charge now, and I'm down here. Uh, and it's a great thing. She's a good boss, for one thing. You should really have Michaela. She should be your next speaker. She's awesome. Okay, just, <laughs> but uh, it, partly it works because 
she has got energy for stuff that honestly I don't have as much energy for anymore. You know, it's like Fuller Williams. Some of you worked in academic settings. You know, they always want reports. It's like, why do you want this report? Nobody's going to read it. It doesn't matter. I get very cranky. Like, they ask me a five page report on something. I, I'd be really cranky. Michaela's like, yeah, I got to write this five page report. I'm just going to bang it out tonight. It's good. It's a good partnership. All right. Surprise number eight. <clears throat> what pastors desire. And I mentioned this to you already, so I will not talk about it more. But I do hear from people, and I'm sure it is true in some context, that pastors really aren't caring much about the older people in the church. And I've heard people say that, you know, there's so much focus here on youth and young families that I, I really feel like I don't matter. And, and I'm, I believe that's true. But what I, what I learn again and again, well, I, of course, I, I should say, I relate. All right. <laughs> Um, when I was a pastor, like attracting young families was everything, which meant I was big time into VBS. This is me and my associate pastor. I'm pretending to be Steve Irwin, you know, the, that guy who got killed by the stingray or whatever it was. Uh, there we are. It's one of my elders. So I've got an elder in the middle. I'm the pirate. My, so, I mean, I was all in <laughs> for reaching youth and kids and young families, all in. I was not resistant to reaching older adults. Honestly, I just think I never thought about it. Like it just like, never occurred to me that that's something you should be thinking about. Uh, but what I keep on hearing again and again from pastors is that they care about their people and they want all their people to grow as disciples of Jesus. And they're watching the aging of their church and they're not saying, oh, this is just a terrible thing. They're saying, wait, these are people that we need to care for and help grow in Christ. They're also watching the community, and they say, wow, the mission field is changing here. How are we going to deal with this? They want their churches to flourish, including the people they have. And, but many pastors are sensing they don't know what to do, and especially ones that are younger, and I appreciate that they, they acknowledge that. Okay, two more surprises. Number nine, grow young with older people. Now, the, the whole growing young thing, and I know you had Jake Mulder out, and I understand that in some quarters that kind of stirred the pot a little bit, uh, because sometimes those of us who are older are like, well, growing young is great, but what about us, right? Do we matter? Does our voice matter? Uh, the interesting thing about the book Growing Young, and I don't know if Jake talked about it, but in chapter 5, uh, they talk a lot about the value of intergenerational relationships. So in chapter five, which is uh, fuel a warm community, in the subhead, warm intergenerational relationships grow everyone young. The point they make is that churches that have strong intergenerational life are actually attracting younger people. They're growing young. Now I'll tell you, I'm watching this at the church that I'm a part of now. Yeah, I don't need to read all of it. The church I'm a part of, it's a smaller church, Presbyterian church, been around for not as long as you folks, but pretty good for California. I think it was founded in 1875. Um, ironically and providentially, this is the church that one of my great-grandfathers and grandmothers attended for 58 years. You know, it's in the next town over. And uh, I'm there partly because they called a new pastor who was somebody I was mentoring my wife and I want to be there to support them in this new work. So we're in this church. It's a small church. They probably have 150 members, but I think they have probably 75 in worship. So a smaller church, I guess 60% at least 65 and older, maybe more. So aging congregation. Here's what I'm, I'm learning in watching this, that many of us who are older think... You know, the younger people aren't going to be interested in me. They don't want to hear from me. So if a younger person or family happens to visit on a Sunday, everybody's like, well, they're not going to want us. And so the younger family is often not welcomed very well. So Pastor Joel, my friend, and 
have been kind of working on this, kind of helping folks say, you know, there actually is an opportunity for you to welcome, and some of these folk are actually going to be looking for connection with older adults. And we're beginning to see some younger families come to the church. And two weeks ago, Joel, before the sermon, asked the congregation, because it was a small group, about this many people, said, you know, how has this church mattered to you? And it was hearing from different people how it mattered. But two of the younger, new young families talked about how welcome they felt in this church. And I'm telling you, the people who welcomed them were the gray hair people. So, of course, there are younger folk that don't want anything to do with those of us who are older and they want to go to the hip and happening church. And, you know, if they're going to church, thank God for it, right? But there are people who are looking for relationship with older adults. There are people who will respond positively. And we need to really see that opportunity. Okay, last surprise. The power of gratitude in the third third of life. Now, there is lots of psychological research in the so-called sort of positive psychology movement that demonstrates if you experience gratitude, that's a good thing for you. It's good for your brain, it's good for your body. Lots of research on this. You can just go dig it up and find all kinds of stuff that says being grateful is good for you. All right. I knew that stuff. What I didn't know was how much research there is on gratitude for older adults. So, for example, these are just some studies that I found, and there are many more, but these are the ones I'm summarizing. Study from the Netherlands. People, who, older adults who ex experience gratitude experience less loneliness. China, older adults who express gratitude less fearful of death. United States, older adults who experience gratitude help dealing with stress. Sweden, less fear of frailty. England, enhanced personal flourishing. Spain, less anxiety and depression. You know, and the reason that I mention the countries is this isn't just, say, a United States thing. It seems to be global, that people who actually feel and experience gratitude when they're older, in particular when they're older, do better in many ways. Uh, one of the things, uh, in the Dupree Center, we have uh, our flourishing in the third, third of life cohorts, small groups of people led by one of our guides, where we go through a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about with you, but really related to our personal lives. And one of the exercises we have people do is what's called a three good things plus exercise. Three good things plus, I take from Martin Seligman, who is a professor of psychology at University of Pennsylvania, who basically, his his research showed that if every day, at the end of the day, you jot down three good things that happened to you in that day and why it mattered, and you do that for a certain period of time, at the end of that period of time, you're going to do way better on physical and cognitive and emotional tests. It's going to be a really positive thing for you. So he encourages people to do the three good things exercise. The plus, as you might guess, is prayer. So yeah, it's great to write down what good stuff happened in the day, but those of us who know the Lord, it's like, Lord, thank you for that good thing. Thank you for that good thing. So we do this. I've done this with people. And it's been amazing to me to see the difference it makes in their lives. And I'm not doing, you know, physical tests or cognitive tests, but I am weighing how it impacts people. Um, my 65th birthday. Yeah, I'll end with this story. So I turned 65 last May 10th. I woke up in the morning, and honestly, I was really sad. I was really down. And I got up, and I'm like, wow, I'm 65. Which is, you know, in the U.S., that's kind of like, that's the line, man. You hit 65, man, that's the line. And I felt fine. He said, I was sad. And I was really bummed that I was sad, too. I was like, oh, gosh, now I was 
down. And so I got up and got ready and I went and, and I started doing my devotions. And, you know, I told the Lord, Lord, I'm really bummed. And I had this, um, and I kind of told God why. Like, and what it was, I, I mean, I feel like my life is mostly over. And I don't want it to be over. And there's some things I can't do now that I could once do. And I got some health issues. Most of my health is good, but I got stuff. It's like I feel like my body is sort of, I tell people, it's like I have a really good used car. I got a lot of mileage left, but you got to go in the shop a lot, right? And some of you probably can relate. You got a good used car, too. And I just, I just tell the Lord how I was bummed. And, and that's something we can do, you know. There's a lot in the Psalms about lament. And I was lamenting. And in the middle of my lament, I had one of those, it's a rare moment for me where it's almost like words I heard as if God spoke to me. And it was, read Psalm 103. And I'm like, wow, read Psalm 103. So I got, where's my, oh, you, you all have like Bibles in this church, huh? Man, I love a church that's actually got a Bible you can access. <laughs> that's so good. So, uh, and I kind of know Psalm 103, but I, I took out, I actually didn't take out my Bible, I took out my phone, and I started reading Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins? I started thinking about some of the major ways I've screwed up in my life. And realizing how that God has forgiven me. Uh, who heals all your diseases? I almost died six years ago. I got a a tick bite that I didn't know I got. I got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, around here, you, that's actually not uncommon. Doctors would recognize it in California. I was like the only one in two, two or three years that had gotten it, and from the part of the state, nobody had ever gotten it before. So I was, I was literally on death's doorstep. And the Lord healed me. Who redeems your life from the pit. I think of times in my life when I was just so down crowns you with love and compassion, satisfy your desires with good things. And I fly by my family. Anyway, you can see what's happening to me here. But then, man, I was laid out, weeping with gratitude. Just so overwhelmed by all that God had given me in my 65 years. And... got finally through that time of prayer and I was in this place I've really I, I've never been before in my life a place of, of like sustained gratitude and you know the last few months there have been challenges and trials but it's sort of like something happened in me and it was pretty amazing I feel very grateful for <laughs> that gift and that the Lord pointed me to that song. Uh, gratitude, as it turns out then, it has such power as we get older. And it doesn't mean we deny the losses, the, the, the pains, uh, but that we also see God's gifts and say thank you. Often there's really goodness in saying thank you to others who mean so much to us. And as it turns out, that's not only good for our emotional well-being, but also for um, our physical and mental well-being. And I did not know, I was surprised, that there is actually all of this research that says, you know what, that's exactly right. Especially as you get older, gratitude is huge. So, we're going to stop there. We have a couple minutes if you want to ask anything or say anything, and then we'll break for lunch that comes in 12 minutes. Mark, you put up that slide uh, from the growing young. Yeah.
Right, right. Uh huh. Right. Growing says you have to turn the keys over. Some are saying, well, forget that. I'm just going to steal your keys. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Are you aware of church-based intergenerational attempts to, to mentor that are, have been recently successful or at least a good track record? Or? Well, there's, so several answers to that question. First is, not many, because what many churches experience is that when you try to sort of program mentoring, it doesn't work very well. But that's not always the case. Uh, Highland Park Presbyterian Church in Dallas is experimenting with a mentoring kind of program. They actually call it discipleship conversations. They found that mentoring was off-putting for some of their folks. And that seems to be working. That's something you might want to check in with, or I'll, I'll get you connected up with a pastor. But... Here's my, here's my sense of where the church is on this. Mentoring is a huge, huge opportunity for us. Not only because we have older adults who would like, this is a generativity thing, would like to give to the next generation. But as it turns out, and we've done research on this in the Dupree Center, a whole lot of younger people want mentors. Now some don't. Okay, fine. But many do. The problem is, well, how do you help those relationships to happen? And that's what we're working on. And we're actually, within this year, we will be coming out with, uh, we're calling it alongside, with actually mentoring curriculum. Number one, to help folks who could be mentors discover how they might do that and what that means and find some uh, confidence and some equipping for that. Uh, so the next step would actually come out with some stuff to help people who would like to be, like to have a mentor. Well, what do you do with that and what does mentoring work on? So I see this as one of the big opportunities for the church that for the most part, let's just say programmatically, we haven't stepped into. There, there certainly, you would certainly have mentoring relationships in this church. I'm sure you do. But I think the, the potential for the church to offer to its own self and then to the wider um, community, something that is that people are hungry for and need, but we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, we found out, for example, many who could be mentors feel insecure about that. I, I expect some of you do. When you hear this mentoring, you think, well, what do I have to offer? I don't know enough. Or, uh, mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's not like a one way mission. Because if we would truly be interested in how our, how maybe we can help them with our experience, but at the same time, we can truly be interested and learn from them right. what they need. Because mentorship in many different ways can be. I mean, Ken, yes, how are you? It's how can I do this? How we work? This is how we You work. absolutely. So that's a huge piece of what we, we will be doing in the training, is help people think of mentorship that way. Because if you think of it, well, a mentor is a really brilliant, wise person who you know, dumps all this stuff on the younger person. Number one, well, I'm not that person. And number two, this person probably doesn't want that, and it's not gonna work. That's why we call it alongside. That it's really coming alongside now those of us who have more life experience might very well have something to offer, but it is in, the, it is in exactly, as you say, that relation, building that relationship. And that's a hard thing to do in churches 
especially when we're kind of age stratified, as we often are. Larger churches in particular, right? Because it's, so we've got, there's stuff we've got to work on. So we're working on it, but I'd love to work with y'all on it because I think this is one of the great opportunities, again, as I say, for the church, but also for the wider community because there's a hunger here and there's a, 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 an ability and a, 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 the generativity need here and we've just got to find ways to make that happen. And I would say, as much as I, I love what Growing Young has said about intergenerational stuff, um, they mentioned mentoring and corporate worship and then they mentioned experimenting with small groups, but they didn't do much with it. That's not really a criticism, that's not what the book is about. We, we need to learn and then we need to share our learning with other churches so that we can begin to get a sense of what, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do it well? All right, I, any, unless somebody has something you're, you're crying out for, then we'll break for lunch. Um, shall I pray for our lunch while we're here? Is that an idea? All right, let's pray. Gracious God, thanks for this time. Thanks for these folks. It's so good to be with them and to be able to share some things. Lord, thanks for those things that I shared. I, I just, I continue to be amazed uh, and excited about truths that I never imagined and the ways in which those can make such a difference in our lives and in our churches. So thank you. Thank for conversations we've had and will have. Thank you, Lord, for the food, for all who have made it and prepared it and gotten it here, and thanks for this church and all they're doing to make this time such a, a welcoming and, uh, and beneficial time. So we ask your blessing on the food and on this meal. Uh, we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, folks, uh, activity room. Folks, welcome back. Thank you to Marsha for bringing us in musically, and uh, we are here for the uh, final lecture, uh, the uh, one o'clock lecture, and so we are so pleased that you've been here today. I want to remind you, though, that you can come back tomorrow, uh, and uh, in fact, right here, tomorrow at nine o'clock. Now, it will be raining, but don't let that disturb, disturb you, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, please do come back and join us at nine tomorrow right here. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session with uh, Dr. Roberts, 10 o'clock here, and then we'll have worship together at 11 in the sanctuary, so that to look forward to. So, hope you enjoyed lunch. Yeah, excellent. Jason, haven't had that since Texas, so I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, it's going to rain. So, y'all aren't Californians. You know about rain here. In California, a little teeny bit of rain, nobody, everybody, nobody goes to church. What? Uh, like what? No. Well, but there's an argument to be made for that's a little more of a thing, right? People, uh, you know, California, they are, we're just kind of ninnies when it comes to weather like that. But that's all right. Okay. Well, so it's after lunch, and that means that if I were in your shoes, I would be getting really ready to take my nap right about now. <laughs> so I'm just saying, odds are pretty good that I won't do that up here. But what that means for you is, I totally get it. So number one, if you want to take a nap, I won't bug you and it won't hurt my feelings. Number two, if you feel like, man, really ought to get up and just walk around, that's good. That, I'm good with that too, because sometimes you just got to do it. So, and it, we, you know, we've had a good lunch and we're kind of full and at least it's not hot in here. Thank you for the, getting the right temperature. You know when it's hot, you're kind of, oh man. Okay. So, I love it, by the way, the bells. That's cool. I, it's just a, are they real bells or are they chimes or is it a, you got real bells. Yes, I'm, that just makes me very happy. The, the, the church I go to now, though, it's a small church. It's an old church, so it has bells. And they ring, and that's just, it just, just like it. Uh huh.
Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Not. Yeah, not uncommon. I got it. Yeah. 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 I figure I'm actually, certainly in the young half, probably in the young third of my current church, so that doesn't happen very much anymore, right? Anyway, well... Uh, in the last talk, when I talked about some sort of surprising discoveries that I've made over the last uh, several years when it comes to Third Third, uh, one of the things that I mentioned but left for later was flourishing on purpose, was the importance of purpose when it comes to flourishing in this season of life. Um, that was the thing I had. I said, we'll come back to it later. So now we're coming back uh, to purpose and aging. So, Rick Warren, some of you know that name. Any of you read uh, Purpose Driven Life or one of those things? Uh, so, in the early 200s, uh, 2000s, I mean, I'm not 200. That, that'd be way too long. <laughs> uh, I was actually at a, at a meeting, a, a small group meeting up at Rick Warren's church with Rick and a few others. And he, um, you know, I was talking to him and how you doing? He said, oh, I'm really excited. Why are you excited? I've just finished this manuscript of this book. Let me show it to you. So we go into his office and he shows me this manuscript. And he said, it's just done. I said, what's it called? It's called The Purpose Driven Life. I said, oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I think this is really going to be good. It's going to help people. Oh, that's awesome. I'd love to read it. So he actually sent me an a electronic version of it even before it was printed or anything. And I, and I remember reading the book and thinking, yeah, this is going to do pretty good. Um, <laughs> Purpose Driven Life, 50 million copies sold. Yeah, wow. I mean, it, it is one of the best-selling Christian books of all time. And there are many reasons for it. Rick is a great communicator and, and biblically solid stuff. But the huge, huge reason, I think, is that why? Because people are yearning for purpose. They want their life to be purpose-driven. And the funny thing was that Rick didn't even think up Purpose Driven as a title. One might be surprised about that, but he was once in a small group with some other Christian leaders, one of whom was my friend Chuck. And they were once talking about, you know, like, who are you as a Christian leader in this little small group? And they're going around, and Rick is sharing how he is a Christian leader. And Chuck says to Rick, you know, what you're really describing, you're a Purpose Driven leader. And Rick says, oh, that's really good. <laughs> you wrote it. <laughs> I said, Chuck, you should have said, just 1%, man, 1%. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, How Great Leaders Inspire Action, a TED Talk given in 2009, in which he said, among other things, by why, he talks about the importance of your why. By why, I mean, what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why do you get out of bed in the morning and why should anyone care? That particular talk, 58,000, excuse me, 58 million views and counting. What would explain it? Again, people are yearning for purpose. People want purpose in their life. They, there's this, this strong sense for it, and many are looking for how to get it. I think of my friend, I'm calling him Jim. That's not his real name, but that's okay. Uh, Jim is fairly recently retired, now been a couple years. And he's very active, he's got a lot going on, but he is restless. And this, what he says to me is, you know, I got all this stuff going on and it's good stuff, but I need something to get me out of bed in the morning. By the way, that's not actually Jim, but... <laughs> the guy who needs some help getting out of bed in the morning. And, you know, partly for him, his life was, for so many years, focused on two main things. One, raising his family. But his kids are grown and out, and they're going, and then it was work, and he was a, a major leader of a major institution, and, and then he retired, and now, though he's multi-talented and has many involvement, he feels like his life is kind of unstructured. And he sometimes thinks, you know, 
I, you know, like he says, I need something to get me out of bed in the morning. Uh, lots of research on the connection of purpose and the third third of life and flourishing in the third third of life. I was surprised to see how much there was. Uh, for example, and here's something from a 2017 study from the Harvard School of Public, uh, of T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health. By the way, if you give Harvard $500 million, literally they will name a school after you, just saying in case any of you are wanting that. Uh, it says, our findings suggest that the sense of purpose in life may play an important role in maintaining physical function among older adults. So not just sense of well-being, but literally like grip strength and walking speed are better for people who have measured a, a good sense of purpose. Uh, purpose contributes to health and longevity. An article in the, in the uh, Washington Post a couple years ago said research has shown that people who have high levels of purpose in life spend fewer nights in hospitals, have lower odds of developing diabetes, and over two times lower risk of dying from heart conditions than do others. Now, this was in my surprise list because I think sure purpose matters, but more for well-being and productivity and living fruitfully, I wouldn't have thought, oh my gosh, having purpose in life has so much to do with how physically healthy you are. Um, an article, Sense of Purpose as a Psychological Resource for Aging Well. Uh, and by the way, again, notice this is from the American Psychological Association Developmental Psychology. This isn't just, you know, you can find anything on the internet. You always want to be careful. But, and actually, you can find anything from academics you want to be careful too. But this is, you know, serious research. Results indicated that participants who scored higher on sense of purpose reported lower levels of functional disability, performed better on cognitive tests, and reported better self-rated health and fewer depressive symptoms. Higher sense of purpose was also associated with increased probability of survival, although this association became weaker over time, because eventually you're going to die. The findings support the notion that purposeful living contributes to health and well-being. Again and again, all of this stuff. Fascinating research on relationship between purpose and Alzheimer's disease. This study from 2012, Effect of Purpose in Life on the Relation Between Alzheimer's Disease, Pathologic Changes on Cognitive function in advanced age. Okay, the quote, higher levels of purpose in life reduce the deleterious effects of Alzheimer's disease, pathological, pathologic changes on cognition in advanced age. And that's a lot of words. But what they're saying is, even if your brain has uh, Alzheimer's disease, if you have a higher level of purpose, it reduces the effects of that and you, you live better. Uh, more, much more recent study in purpose and dementia, sense of purpose in life, healthier cognitive aging. Individuals with a greater sense of purpose maintain better cognitive function and have lower dementia risk. I would not have guessed that. And especially given that earlier study, the 2012 study, that found that basically they took a a whole bunch of people who were older, and they measured their sense of purpose, and then they followed them for many years. And many years later, many of them had died. So then they autopsied their brains. What they find out is that the brains are more or less the same. In other words, having purpose doesn't seem to affect the physiology associated with Alzheimer's. But the, po the folks with a high level of purpose perform better on cognitive tests. They, they report higher well-being. In other words, even though they've got the physical problem, they're doing much better. <coughs> Fascinating. The theory is that somehow the amazing brain that we are given finds sort of ways to rewire itself and purpose somehow generates some of that. So that even if this part of your brain isn't working, your brain figures out how to go around it and make stuff happen. Kind of amazing, the plasticity of the, the brain in that regard. So that's good news. The good news is, if you want to flourish as you are older, uh, have a strong sense of purpose in life. That's good news. But purpose tends to decline as we get older. 
And in fact, it declines more steeply the older we get, like this picture. A little bit sloped, then down, 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 down. It gets, so the older we get, the less we have purpose. So uh, our article in Psychology Today, a bit ago, the pernicious decline of purpose in life with old age. Ouch. Martin Pinkhart, a German psychologist, a professor of psychology and aging international. This, by the way, in 2002, and they've done a lot since then, but all the way back there, he surveyed 70 scientific articles on purpose and aging. That's a lot of, like I said, a lot of study of this. And his conclusion in the meta-analysis, so he didn't actually do a research study, he studied all these and summarized them. In the meta-analysis, we found empirical evidence for an age-associated decline of purpose in life, which became stronger in old age. So good news, purpose will help you flourish. Bad news, it's likely that as you get older, your sense of purpose will decline. And if you think about it, it makes sense, like my friend Jim. I mean, he had clarity of purpose. Raise good kids, have a good family, you do my work, be a good leader in my job and in the institution. And, and he was an elder in his church, Presbyterian church. And, and then all of a sudden, this really wasn't needed so much anymore, and this disappeared. And he continues to be active in his church, but the things that gave him clarity of purpose in life were gone. He sort of, he sort of did it. Now what? So, question for us, how can we maintain, clarify, and live with purpose in the third third of life? And I'm gonna offer 10 suggestions. Like I say, these are suggestions in that some of these are pretty biblical, but it's not as if I'm taking it right out of the Ten Commandments. This is what God says. This is what Mark says in light of a lot of the research I've done, a lot of listening to people. Uh, and, and so that's where your, the, the suggestions are coming from. This also isn't meant to be exhaustive. One could say more. And in fact, I'm guessing that as I continue to do this work, Maybe I'll have more suggestions, or I'll replace one with another, right? So these are, but I feel pretty good about the fact that these suggestions will help. And some are obvious, and you're going to say, yeah, I could have done that. And some maybe not so obvious. So, number one, be committed to God's purpose for all things, including your life. So, if you want purpose for your life, I, I would suggest that as a, as a Christian, the starting point isn't to think about you, but to think about God. And what is, God's do what is God doing? What is God doing in the whole cosmos? What is God doing in the world? What is God's purpose, or what are God's purposes? Uh, Rick Warren, beginning of Purpose Driven Life, says it's not about you. I knew I got that line from someone. The purpose of your life is far greater than your fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. Okay. Well, there are many ways to talk about God's purpose in Scripture. One of them that I have been especially attached to comes out of the first chapter of Ephesians. Partly because some years back I wrote a commentary on Ephesians. I spent a lot of time working on Ephesians. But this is sort of it, one statement of God's purpose. It says, God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Here it is. To gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, I mention this because I think most of us I think you could go out and interview all the Christians in Fayetteville. Say, what is God's plan or purpose? And I don't think anybody would quote this to you. Because it's, you don't even know what it means. Or what is, what is this language? We don't talk much about it. The gathering up of all things, what you have to remember, is that God created the world very good. God created a perfect world. We were to be fruitful and multiply, but what did we human beings do? We rebelled against God. We sinned. And what happened? Things all kind of broke apart. 
Relationships broke apart. God's plan and purpose is ultimately to gather up or to unify, to bring back together all things in Christ. In other words, to put the world back the way God intended it from the beginning in Christ. So it's not only saving individual souls, that's a big part of that, but it's, it's, it's literally God remaking and renewing the world. And what Ephesians goes on to show us is that we, we have a significant part of that, both as receivers, but also as participants in this part of God's work. And there's so many other ways to talk about God's purpose. But the more you reflect on what is God doing, the more it'll center you and ground you for what you ought to be doing in your life. So you don't start with you, you start with God. Second suggestion. Seek the Lord in prayer and surrender to his will. And again, I think you probably could have you know, gotten that without help from me. But it's important to say it, especially the seek the Lord in prayer and surrender. Because we have been taught in Scripture, rightly so, that prayer in prayer we can bring our requests to God. We can, we can tell God what we would like God to do. Right? We can. That's a good thing. Jesus teaches us to do that. But Jesus also taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Your will be done in my life. Um, I mean, the most extraordinary and moving example of that kind of surrender, of course, was Jesus in the garden. Not my will, but your will be done. So absolutely, it's fine to say, Lord, show me what my purpose, show me what you have for me to do. But we also need to learn to give over to God all that we are. There's a, a prayer that has been particularly meaningful to me in recent years called the Sushipe by St. Ignatius. Any of you familiar with this? So St. Ignatius was a, a, a Christian many centuries ago and uh, a very godly and wise man. Um, and one of the prayers that he taught, that he used and taught people is called the Sushipe. That comes from the first word. If we were reading this in Latin, where it says, take Lord, it would be Sushipe, Domine, take Lord. So, this is his prayer. Take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. All I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Now, I've been praying that prayer every morning for about three years. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't think I can really fully wholeheartedly pray everything in there, really. Because I still, ah, can I really surrender everything? Is, is, was God's love and grace really be enough for me? So this is kind of a, an aspirational prayer. I want it to be true. I want to live into it and grow into it. But it's that, that daily surrender, take everything about me and receive everything about me. And that's, I think, an essential part of coming to clarity about what God's purpose is for our lives as we give everything over to God. By the way, in Scripture, purpose and calling go hand in hand. And calling, as I expect you might know in Scripture, isn't just something for sort of pastors and missionaries, but all of us are called into the ministry of Christ. All of us are called according to God's purpose. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. That means for you, you are called by God into his work, into relationship with him and into his work. And it's according to his purpose, not your purpose. Similarly, 2 Timothy 1.9, God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Now, let's be clear. This doesn't mean that 
God is necessarily calling you to a very specific task or role, though God can certainly do this. This is more about the calling to all believers to be in relationship with God and to serve God with our lives. And that calling is a reflection of God's purpose for all things and for you. Now, why is that important? There are many reasons why that's important. But one of them is that, you know, there's a lot of talk out there, especially around graduations, about, you know, finding your passion. Find your passion and do it. If you find your passion and do it, then that's a great thing. You've got to find your passion. And I, I, that's not altogether a bad thing to do, to find your passion. Um, of course, those of us who believe that, you know, we're kind of sinners might say, well, what if my passion isn't so godly? <laughs> so you want to be careful with that. Passion can matter. But more importantly for us, it isn't our, our passion, what we want in here, so much as what God is calling us to. And often, it is as we respond to God's call that we begin to then actually feel a passion for the thing to which God calls us. Um, sometimes the passion doesn't come first. The call comes first. So I'm not saying don't pay attention to your passion, but I am saying discern what God is calling you to and surrender as you surrender to his will. Okay, number three. Pay attention to how God has made and gifted you. You think of uh, Psalm 139. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, you are a unique person a unique creation of God, not only that, but you are gifted by the Spirit of God who has been given to you, and you have certain gifts and talents and abilities, and you need to pay attention to those if you're going to d discern what your purpose is. Because it is most likely, almost inevitable, that whatever your, God's purpose for your life is, is going to be consistent with your gifts and talents and abilities. I mean, every now and then God will call us to things that are way out of the ordinary and God has to supply extra help. And God can do that. But by saying, well, what has God given me? And what has God given me to steward? That can also be relationships. It can be uh, a certain position or, or physical things God has entrusted to me or whatever it is. And that's true, by the way, even as you get older. Uh, there's a tendency uh, in the wider culture to imagine that as people get older, among other things, their brains get worse. And, you know, many of us would know the experience, for example, of forgetting things that we once would remember. You know, I, I mean, I bet you most of you know the experience of like, gosh, I know that name, but I can't, I just can't call it up right now. Or you go into the kitchen and you think, why did I come in the kitchen? And these are fairly common experiences for people as we get older. Uh, in sort of the pop psychology world, it's like, well, that's because as you get older, your brain is not as good at certain things. The reality is that your brain is changing. And your brain is actually getting better at certain things and not as good at other things. Like, one of the reasons you forget stuff, it's not because you're just, your brain sort of goes on static. It's because chances are you're thinking about other things more than you once did. That your brain is tending to work really hard, and so your keys just got left out. And you forget stuff. You lose stuff. This is my pet peeve. Man, I just lose stuff because I can't remember where I put it. But my brain is still pretty good. Now, Gene Cohen, who was a, a psychiatrist, study, a person who studied the mind neuroscience, he says the complex neural architecture of older brains built over years of experience, practice, and daily living is a fundamental strength of older adults. Yes, we lose certain abilities to an extent, but most of us, if we don't have you know, major dementia, most of us actually have 
a fundamental strength in the new way our brains think. By the way, latest research on dementia, one-tenth of adults 65 and older have dementia, and about half of those are the folks over 90. Now, that's still something we gotta pay attention to and care for, and I'm sure you probably know people in your immediate family or uh, friends who are in that, but sometimes, in, in pop culture, sometimes it's almost as if everybody over 75 is just gonna lose it. That's not scientifically accurate. And in many ways, folk over 75 have some advantages that younger folk don't have. Arthur Brooks' book, Strength from Strength to Strength, says when you are young, you have raw smarts. When you're old, you have wisdom. When you are young, you can generate lots of facts. When you're old, you know what they mean and how to use them. Uh, in case you're wondering about all this, you're saying, ah, oh, man, I wonder what my gifts and strengths are. A couple suggestions specific. One is there, there are some different assessments, and there are more than these, but these are some that I, I find helpful. Clifton Strengths used to be Strengths Finder, now called Clifton Strengths, is a way of just really, you, you pay a little money, you take an online test, and you can discover, you know, here are my main strengths. And it's uh, the Enneagram, a lot of folks have loved the Enneagram. Um, uh, True Motivate, something you may be less familiar with, but it's a, a um, again, an online test that has a lot of psychological research behind it that will help you identify your motivations. Uh, Myers-Briggs, probably more familiar to many of us, been around for a while. There are other ways, but the other thing I want to encourage you to do, if you're in this place of trying to figure out what, what is your purpose, ask the people who know you well what they think you're good at. And you could get really bold and ask them what you're not so good at, but mostly ask them what you're good at. What do you think I'm good at? And see what you hear. And pay attention to it. I think I mentioned to you that as I was resisting getting into this third, third work, my friend Todd Bolsinger was the guy who kept on saying, you got to do this thing. He's actually more than once in my life. So way back long ago when the church in Irvine first reached out to me and was interested in maybe having me as their pastor, and I was very resistant. Todd was the guy who was saying, no, you really need to check that out. When I was at Irvine and the people in Texas at Lady Lodge reached out to me, I didn't even call them back for 18 months. And Todd was saying, no, you gotta go there. You gotta go there. So same thing happened going to Fuller. So basically, I'll, I should just put here, talk to Todd Bolsinger, <laughs> yet I'll be good. No, the point is, the people who know you well, who love you, who can tell you the truth, who, who, these, these people can help. Okay, suggestion number four. Pay attention to what God is putting on your heart. Uh, again, so this isn't quite passion. It could be your passion. But we're really asking a different question. What is it that God is giving me that, I, that I'm caring about? What is God putting on my heart? Or sometimes it's whom is God putting on my heart? Uh, it may not be a, a, a cause. It may be very specifically some people. I think, for example, of... Um, so there's, uh, there's some students over there. Uh, I was working with some of the folk in my church on this stuff and purpose. And, and one of the women shared, she came back in a couple weeks later, was very excited because she was trying to figure out what has God put on my heart? She's a retired school teacher. Uh, she was looking for a clear sense of purpose in life. There was an elementary school kind of right up the street from her. So she goes to the elementary school and goes into the office and, you know, could I talk to somebody and, you know, the principal or whoever it was. And she says, look, I'm a retired teacher. I've got some time. Could I do anything helpful here? And they're like, oh, man, we could really use like, someone like you out on the playground just because we have the playground attendance, but we need somebody to be with the students. And, and God put this on her heart. And now she's super excited. She gets to do this. The person over here is someone who is uh, becoming a citizen 
I know a woman in, in uh, Arizona who her, her work up until you know, retirement from paid employment was as an insurance person, successful insurance person. When she got done, she just knew strongly she wanted to invest her life in immigrants and immigrants becoming part of this country. And that was where she felt a call. Pay attention with God's plan. For many of you, it'll be your family, your grandchildren, your church, but pay attention to what it is. Number five, pay attention to where you are bearing fruit. Pay attention to where you are bearing fruit, where God is using you now. If you think, well, I, I, you know, I really like to mentor people, at least ask yourself, am I in any relationships where mentoring kind of happens? Uh, I think, I, I can't remember if it was last night or today when I mentioned my grandfather who had been, uh, it, was my, it was my 30th birthday. That's what I looked like then. And, that's not, and now I look more like that guy. Uh, <laughs> but that's good. I love to look like that guy. But my grandfather, Poppy, was, uh, you know, he was amazing. But when he retired as a civil engineer, he just kept doing engineering for free because he was bearing fruit. And he'd b done that fruit bearing in his professional life it was easy to keep doing it. Now, in his case, it was very much the same kind of work. For other us, others of us, it's going to be a, a similar kind of work, but different. I think of my friend Steve, who in his work life, especially as he got on in years, he became a, a really important mentor to younger people in the company. As he is retired now, he wants to be able to give more and more of himself to mentoring, not so much in the context of his company, but in other relationships and very much in the context of his church. It's a place where he's born fruit. It's likely that he will bear fruit in the future. Number six, look for continuity, but be open to surprises. So both of those examples I just gave are a fair amount of continuity. My purpose here was to build buildings, I mentored people, so it kind of makes sense that I'll continue doing that sort of thing. But it could be that God has something surprising for you. You know, you think about Moses. He's out taking care of the sheep in the middle of nowhere. Um, I suppose you could say, well, then he's going to be the shepherd of Israel, but that's a pretty big switch from watching the sheep to delivering the Israelites out of Egypt. God sometimes calls people things. Now you could say, well, but he had the experience back there in Egypt and he was part of the royal family. And yeah, that makes sense. But still, I mean, and if you read the story in Exodus 3 and 4, for Moses it was not what he was expecting. This is not, oh yeah, now that I'm a shepherd, I'm just going to go back to Egypt and leave all the people of Egypt out, right? All the Israel's out of Egypt. That, that was a big... So that was a surprise. Uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah, a bit surprised that they were going to give birth to a son in their old age. Um, Zechariah, so surprised that he got in a little trouble and couldn't speak for a long time. Elizabeth was just delighted, but it, was, it really was a surprise, and God can surprise us. I think of a couple of my friends, Mary, I've mentioned to you before, she was the Vermeer person. Jimmy is another person um, who's actually a supporter also of our work. But Jimmy also, he, he and a friend founded a company quite a while ago, built a giant company, and then they sold it, and he's in retirement, and what he's spending a lot of time with right now is watching his grandchildren and being, because then his, to help his children, and he loves his grandchildren. You know, not really the same thing. I don't know if it's what he would have expected five years ago, but he loves it. I mean, every time I talk to Jimmy now, he starts telling me about his grandchildren, and he's like a different guy. He is, he's so happy. <laughs> and the former Jimmy was a good, good man, but was not happy in the way that he is today. So there may be surprises. And then, there, you know, continuity... Surprises, there's me. And I, as I've told you before, if you had told me, you know, even five years ago, 
you're going to be putting an awful lot of your time into this third, third work. I would have said, no, I'm not. I, I, I don't really want to. And it's, I'm not, you know, I'm not a gerontologist. I don't know that I have that kind of expertise. And I, I just, that was just what, not what I was thinking. But if you think about what I was trained to do, it makes some sense. There is some continuity. I mean, I, I hope you'll walk away from today thinking, well, he did use the Bible and seemed to know it, because that would be a strength of mine. My, my pastoral experience has helped me here. Uh, though all the fields that I've researched are not my field, I was trained academically, so I can kind of draw on that. And so th there, there is continuity even with a, a different term. So I, I would say, yeah, I'm surprised, but yeah, there, it's not as if I'm you know, a rodeo rider, because that would not be a, a, a really continuous with anything, and I would probably die. <laughs> Quickly, I will die eventually, but uh, not doing rodeo. All right, seven. Get in touch with your generativity. I have talked about generativity earlier. That is the desire to make a difference in the next generation. So the desire to leave a legacy that matters. And when I say get in touch with it, some of you I know you are already. My guess is some of you, you kind of know it's there, but you haven't really let it, you know, sort of percolate in you. You haven't really thought about it. What, what, what do I really want to to leave behind when I'm gone, uh, and I think there's, there's real potential. Uh, again, generativity, the need to nurture and guide younger, gener younger people, contribute to the next generation. Eric Erickson was the, the main thinker about this in generativity. Um, and that can have uh, many different facets. Uh, we find it in scripture, by the way. Psalm 71. Again, I, I may have mentioned this, but O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to all the generations to come. That's generativity. Let me say, by the way, that those of you who are grandparents or may become grandparents, one of the most important tasks I believe God gives you is giving the faith to the next generations in your own family. Now, I imagine that some of you have children who are very faithful in Christ and will also be doing that work. But grandparents matter. In some cases, it may be that your children aren't walking as closely with the Lord and you will be the major influence for Christ in the life of your grandchildren. Uh, my own faith, my, my parents are both Christians, they certainly helped and guided me in my Christian faith. But if you were to add up you know, um, hours talking to older adults in my young life about faith, I'll bet you I talked with my grandparents 10 times as much as my parents. Because they were around and I could talk to them. My, my dad was at work. My mom was busy. So think in terms of that. Suggestion eight, experiment your way forward. Dave Evans, uh, co-author of the best-selling book, Designing Your Life, says life design is an iterative, that is a frequently repetitive process of prototypes and experimentation. In other words, if you want to live into your purpose, if you want to really even discover and clarify the purpose that God has for you, don't think, okay, I gotta get it all figured out perfectly before I do anything. That really will not be helpful. Just begin to walk into some things, try some things, do some things. And, and don't, if possible, don't overcommit at the beginning. You know, so like the woman who went to the elementary school I mentioned to volunteer. I mean, don't go and say, hey, I'm looking for something to do the next five years and, and kind of bind yourself into things. I mean, obviously, certain kinds of things require 
you know, a, a period of time of commitment. You know, you, you don't want people in your choir for a week, right? You, yeah, you can't do that. But try some things out. Uh, to me, this is one of the more freeing things that I have discovered in the last few years about all kinds of things in life, because I tend to be the sort of person who likes to figure everything out way in advance. And if I, if I had been that kind of person when the third, third stuff came up, I mean, honestly, I don't know that I would have stepped into it, because I really didn't much know what exactly we were supposed to do. Uh, you know, I can just start walking into this and learning and talking to people and trying some things. I mentioned to you that retreat where I tried a couple things with folk that I had been thinking about and saw God use it. Like, whoa, this is, this is really something. And so there is, um, I think for many of us, this idea, I'm, I'm going to experiment with some things. See what happens. It's a, it's a, it's a good way forward. Suggestion number nine, discover and discern your purpose in community. You know, I mean, Moses, counterexample. Can God call you to something when you're all by yourself with just a bunch of sheep out in the middle of nowhere? Of course God can do that. And God sometimes does that. But, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Even in the New Testament example, say, of Paul, that was a very miraculous encounter he has on the road to Damascus, but, but Ananias was the one who kind of confirmed it for him. There was a role of the Christian community. Uh, and so we need to think more in terms of, say, the picture of Christian community in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, where one of the ways the gifts function in community is that God will give others gifts of knowledge and wisdom, exhortation, different kinds of gifts, that will help us know what it is God is calling us to do. And so knowing your purpose is usually not something you're just going to figure out on your own. There are going to be some of those who know you well, close friends, family, spouse, if you have one. Uh, but also I think within the context of the church, we need to be a place that helps people figure out where, where God is calling them in this season of life. Uh, and, you know, that's nothing new for those of us who are Presbyterian, by the way. I mean, this is a, this is a photo I found online, but this is a, just a Presbyterian ordination. And, you know, when you get ordained in the Presbyterian church, you don't just walk up to Pastor Mike one day and say, hey, I think I want to be a pastor. Mike says, okay, great. You know, here you go. You say, well, okay. Get ready. This is going to take a lot of years. And there's going to be a lot of committees and a lot of stuff you've got to do. And there's this, one could say, well, that's kind of a cumbersome thing. But that's the way we do things. Why? Because we really believe that we need community. We need others to help us discern our call. And that's true for things like ordained ministry in the, as a pastor, sure. But I would suggest it's also similarly true for, for the other things we do in life. We need each other. We need somebody to say, hey, you're good at that. Would you be interested in doing that? I, uh, a friend of mine who uh, has now been an ordained pastor for, Presbyterian pastor for, I don't know, let's just say 30 years. He was, a, he was um, working actually in the music industry in Hollywood. And uh, I was looking for a youth leader. And... Somebody told me, O'Neill wants to be a youth leader, uh, wants to be a volunteer in the youth group. So I'm a great. So I invite him to lunch. We sit down for lunch. And so in the lunch, I say, so I hear you want to be a volunteer in the, in the youth group. He looks at me like, huh? I said, yeah, I, I hear that's what you, well, I don't know where you got that. <laughs> wow, okay. So I said, well, would you be interested? He, I don't know, I could try. So he stepped in, he became a, a, a youth leader. Turned out he had some talent for that, some gifting for that. And I could kind of help him discern, like, man, this is good. Well, a couple years later, I'm in a small group with him, two other guys, and Neil is, is sharing with us, you know, I wonder sometimes if I, could, if I should be a pastor. 
And, but he says, there's no way I can be a pastor. I got a family, I got to support my family, I got to work, I don't see how I can go back to school. And so we as a group, we start praying with him to discern what is God calling him to do. Uh, the group decides that this is something really God has for him. A uh, couple guys in the group were in the, in the entertainment industry and made a lot of money. So they said to him at one point, like, well, actually, what it cost for you to do seminary? And it was like $150,000. Like, well, what if we gave you that money? Would you go? And he did. Now, it doesn't always work that way, unless you're hanging out with people with a lot of wealth. But the point was, Neil would never have gotten to that point, apart from the community helping discern. Now, this is interesting. Remember this guy, Martin Pinkwart, German professor of psychology, who, in Aging International, he's the guy who said, purpose is really important, but there's this decline of purpose as we get older. But he also asked the question, well, what helps people maintain their purpose as they get older? And this is what he writes. We analyze which factors may promote the maintenance of high levels of purpose in life in older adults. We found that social integration, and in particular a high quality of social contacts, showed the strongest association with purpose in life. We conclude that developing close social ties and building up a large social network is an important way of preventing declines of purpose in life. Or to put it in familiar language, it's all about relationships, relationships, relationships. Isn't that something? So earlier I talked about what's the most important thing according to the research who want to flourish in the third third of life. Relationships are important. Well, now we have a very specific example of why. One reason is if you have strong relationships, your relationships will help, main, help you maintain your sense of purpose. If you have a strong sense of purpose, you're more likely to flourish. And that's just one of many uh, ways in which relationships help us flourish in this season of life because they help us not only discern but live into our purpose. Suggestion 10, last suggestion, pay attention to your joy. I think of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that sings, clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, Jesus was motivated by joy and the anticipation of joy, even in going to the cross, which we would not often associate with joy. I'm not saying he was joy, he was feeling joyful in that suffering so much as the anticipation of it was a motivation for him. And it, it, it was, so pay attention to your joy. Uh, John 15, crucial text for us in this uh, third, third flourishing. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So one of the ways we discern God's call upon our life, God's purpose for our lives is by paying attention to what gives us joy. And I think you know that joy isn't the same as kind of necessarily lighthearted happiness. Sometimes joy is, is mixed with sorrow. I, I, I expect you've probably been at a memorial service for a loved one in which you have this extraordinary mix of joy and sorrow right in that very moment. So grateful and, and happy about the wonderful life of this person and sad that this person is gone. 
so joyful that they are with the Lord and sad that they're not with you. And, and so we're not talking here about a kind of a superficial happiness, but rather attending to what are the things that when you do them, or what are the relationships that when you're with, you, you just have this deep sense of, of sort of rightness and gladness. And I think we need to pay attention to that. That Jesus it intends us to bear much fruit because the fruit glorifies God and that would be enough. But, he says, also so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This isn't disconnected from the thing I shared earlier, one of the discoveries that those who are older can and often are happier than those who are younger. And I just think of some of the people I've known over the years who, as they get older, experience many of the losses and, and difficulties of older age and yet have managed to continue on in joy. Joy is a gift from God. Joy because they're, they're focusing on the things in life that matter. Joy because they, they sense God's gifts and feel grateful for them. So pay attention to your joy. Um, just a review. So, 10 suggestions. Uh, there may be others, and I would be happy to hear some of your ideas about that either in just a minute or two, or you can email me later. But just to remind you, be committed to God's purpose for all things, including your life. And I really do believe that if we meditate and reflect on what God has done and is doing in Christ, that is like absolutely core to discerning your purpose. Seek the Lord in prayer and surrender to his will. Pay attention to how God has made and gifted you. Pay attention to what God is putting on your heart. Pay attention to where you're bearing fruit. Look for continuity, but be open to surprises. Get in touch with your generativity. Experiment your way forward. Discover and discern your purpose in community. Pay attention to your joy. So, what are you all thinking? And I know it's, it's, we're not going to go long, long, because it's afternoon, and it's probably nap time for several of us, but questions, comments, thoughts about purpose. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. There you go. So coming out of this project, I mean, I, I saw online you have like a seminar or like a, a plant type thing. I mean, are there resources and publications coming? Um, are you still gathering insights? I mean, all, a yes to all of that, but let me explain. <laughs> so am I still gathering input? Yeah. Endlessly. I, I mean, I just think there is so much to learn here. I, I try to follow what's going on in, um, you know, in, in recent research. There was just a study released this last month that found that one of the things that is really essential for flourishing in the third third of life physically is hydration. And on the other fact, being dehydrated is actually a huge problem for older adults. Um, that I had never seen before. It doesn't surprise me. I know hydration matters for everybody, but yeah, a few of you got, you, who's got your water bottle? I mean, uh, but now there's research that actually shows in very definitive ways how easy it is for older adults to become dehydrated and how bad it is for them. I'm like, wow, okay, I wanna share this with people. So I am continually in this learning and sharing process. Uh, that particular piece hasn't been, doesn't exist in anything that I have made. But where, where, but let me, so partly, I put this up before, but if you get our newsletter, you'll just stay up to date, not only in what we're doing, but I always have a, two or three articles updating folk on things I'm learning and things in the news. So that's number one. Um, but there are other things that you will find there. The third, third journal, is just a collection 
of all the articles that mostly I have written over the last several years. I think we got like 84 of them in there now. So it's, it's just all free stuff. Uh, webinars, every year I will sit down with some wise folk uh, on Zoom and we'll talk about third third and we'll get wisdom from them. I've got a couple of really awesome ones coming up. I um, now have friendship with a, a gerontologist who is also a wonderful Christian, and I'm so excited to talk to her, and a, um, uh, an older black woman from Houston who is amazing, has her PhD in education, is an ordained pastor, is a licensed uh, therapist, and also an amazing Christian. I'm going to talk to her about her insight. So, so the webinars are there. Now, there are two things currently on our, uh, through, that we produce that are things that individuals or churches can purchase. So one is the flourishing course. Do you guys own that? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Yeah, the way that works, so the flourishing course is six sessions. It's videos, um, 30 minutes each. It's me. Some of it will be familiar. About half will be familiar. Half will be unfamiliar. Um, and then there's small group questions and personal study questions, and there's a workbook. And the way it works is the church pays $125, and they own the rights to do this as many times you ever want to do it. And then we charge $10.99 per person for the workbook from here on out. So that's how that works. Um, and it's awesome that, that you've got it. An individual can buy and use the course at half off if they want to do that. But it's happening at church, so that's awesome. The flourishing cohorts are a rather new thing. What that is, it's basically taking all the learning that's in the course, but it's repackaging it into a more an intimate and reflective experience. So the cohorts are from about five to 10 in numbers of people, and six sessions, two hours a session. But what we do there, it isn't so much lecture, it's not information transfer, as it is inviting people into a reflective experiences and then share, sharing some of their learning. So for example, one of the things we do right up front is we, um, uh, in fact, the very first thing, the first thing, we set aside a period of time for people to think, what are you really longing for in this season of life? I mean, ironically, that's one of the questions that often people in our stage of life aren't asked for. Like, what do you really want? I mean, not just, oh yeah, I want to travel and I'd be able to, but what are you yearning for? What is, and so we want to, so we get people into that, and then there's some sharing in group about that, and uh, so, so the cohort basically is a more in-depth experience. Uh, it is led by somebody that we have trained who is a wise and mature, responsible person to lead that, and we lead that through. Now, those are, those are more expensive. It's $500 to be in that cohort, and if that sounds like a lie, it's just we got to pay the bills. I mean, we're, not, we're a nonprofit. We're not making any money. But I will say, and this is important for you, but also for anybody else, we work with people. So if somebody says, yeah, I, I can't, that, uh, that's a lot. We'll, we'll figure it out uh, because we really want people to be in it. Uh, those, so those are existing things. Now what's coming, I mentioned earlier, are alongside mentoring material. And that is on the cusp of being released in different formats. And so the best way to know how that's going is if you subscribe to our newsletter, we'll keep you in informed at some time in this year we'll begin to have some stuff there but I also I mean I see this as a as an organic and growing thing and, and so as people have ideas or ask for support or um, you know uh, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be helpful if you would do this thing I mean this whole thing got going really at the very beginning because one guy said you guys got to do something about this and so I'm committed to really attending to where people are. And then, you know, because some people are supporting this financially, I'm able to go put in the time to do the work that would be hard for you to do and make it available. You know, that's kind of how it works. Any other questions or comments? 
Excuse me. Do you have a TED Talk? I do not have a TED Talk. I would, I would, I've done, I haven't done official TED Talks, but I've done TED style talks in places. Those are terrifying to give. I don't know, anybody of you ever done a TED Talk? You're not supposed to use notes, and it's really, it's, it, so maybe someday. This will be, but at the moment, no. Uh, man, okay, you're making me think. All right, <laughs> that's interesting. I know. Well, let me just say, we'll, we'll finish up here. I'm, I'm preaching tomorrow. I'm preaching on the, the passage from the Psalms, but it won't be completely redundant to you. A little bit will be, but this is really a, a, a broader invitation to folks to flourish and as you've mentioned, there'll be question and answers here tomorrow. I'm kind of hoping that some of you will come back with some questions and answers, because if none of you come, then the only people will be people that haven't heard any of this. No, no guilt, I'm just saying. If, if you're able to come, you may also be saying, I heard enough of you, and I'm, I'm good. I, I'm, so that's, whatever you do is fine. But, uh, and it, it, but I have so much enjoyed being with you, I started this time by just saying how much I appreciate your church and you for your interest and that you care about these things. This stuff really matters. Uh, I hope even at now you even sense more both that it matters and why and some of the potential for your own life and for your church and the community. So I just want to say thank you for your being you know, with me in this process. Remember earlier on I mentioned I would love to hear from you. If I get a lot of emails, I'll be slow in responding, but I will eventually, I promise. And then, if you think about it, six months out or whatever, if there's really been something in your life, some change, I would love to get your story. Like, whatever. Uh, it just because one of the things I want to curate are stories of what God is doing in, in the lives of ordinary people, right? When I say ordinary there are these stories in the news about like 90-year-old women who won, run marathon. Well, if that's you, that's just great. But most of us aren't saying, oh yeah, I'm going to do that, right? I think we need stories from folk that are just us who are living into their third third of life in ways that are flourishing and, and giving them joy. So I would love to hear from you later on. Pastor Mike. Thanks. Quick reminder, I'll renew my Calvin Lectures pitch. If you love the Calvin Lectures, consider supporting it as we go forward, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. So that we can continue to invite some of the best thinkers uh, in Christian uh, thinking to come to First Presbyterian Church. Uh, thanks to Sue Goblin and to Steve for all the work they put in today to help things happen. Uh, so and thanks to you for investing your time. So let's close in prayer and we'll go. <laughs> Father, thanks for today. Uh, Lord, take these words and apply them to our hearts that we might live fully and fruitfully and faithfully for you in all the time that you have given us and that we might find joy in being your people. Uh, bless us, our God, until we gather again. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.